Hey, what's up, psychos? Welcome to another episode of Take Your Pill Psychopath, the comedy podcast that exploits mental illness for personal profit. What? Trademark. I'm your host, John F. O'Donnell. J. Fod, how is everybody doing out there? I'm doing pretty well. I just moved, y'all. I moved into a new place. Uh, I'm excited about it. The room is really small, but it's cheap. It's in New York City. I'm doing my thing. I'm like this crazy little guy in this crazy little room talking into a crazy little microphone about crazy little things. I like it. Keeps me sharp. Keeps my podcasting strong. Keeps my stand-up strong. I'm doing it, man. So I'm feeling all right. Staying on top of my mental health. Taking my meds, staying sober. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, Eating healthily. Trying my best. My energy level and creativity feels good. I'm hoping I can stay consistent with it. Um, feeling good about my stand-up, working on putting that hour together. I hope all of you are doing well. I hope you're doing the best that you can in this crazy, difficult time that we are living in. I hope you psychos are having some fun, having some joy, having some laughter in your lives because, uh, you know, fuck it. This world is a shitstorm, but it doesn't mean we can't enjoy ourselves. It doesn't mean we can't have some laughter and some smiles along the way because fuck the evil forces that are trying to keep us down, man. Fuck them. Fuck them where they live. That's what I say. Um, yeah, so a couple plugs. I'm so excited for this week's guest. It's going to be awesome, man. A um, couple things, guys. If you're not on my newsletter yet, please join that at jfodnews.com. It's a great way to keep in touch with me and find out about upcoming podcasts. Sometimes I write stories there, uh, tour dates, if I can ever get my ass on the road and figure out how to make that economically viable. It's challenging. Um also, my Patreon, guys, you get a, an extra bonus episode of Take Your Pill Psychopath every week if you join the Patreon. I, uh, I find, I, I scour, scour the interwebs to find interesting pieces about psychology, and I put them all together, and I read them, and I give commentary, and it's oh so fun. So it's a great way to support the show. So if you can afford to throw me a few bones, please do. It's patreon.com slash jfod slash jfod. And uh, it would mean the world to me. So uh, do it if you can. Um, Also, you guys can check out my stand-up comedy special for free on YouTube. All you have to do is type my name into the YouTube search and it'll show up. It is on the 800 Pound Gorilla Records YouTube channel. And it's called The Manic Depressive Chocolate Fountain Operator. And I think you guys would dig it. So those are the plugs. So without further ado, I'm so psyched to introduce this week's guest. It's... Sid Casey. Hey, Sid. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so, so psyched. This is Sid's second appearance on the podcast. I'm so excited to have you back. Um, yeah, this is going to be such a great perspective on things. Because a lot of times I di- I interview people with, with that have different diagnoses, which you have your own diagnoses, but you're on the other side of it because you have acted as a nurse, a nurse practitioner. So what I'm going to ask you first to do is to please... Uh, reintroduce yourself to the psycho community <laughs> sure yeah so i'm i'm an rn not a nurse practitioner just a registered nurse so i can't like prescribe but um every you know all the other parts of care um uh, as far as that goes um yeah uh rns do a lot of different things but uh just to be clear i'm not an np uh, <laughs> yeah as i said that word i was like i don't even know if that's the case <laughs> <laughs> but i went for it i appreciate that you you think that i'm already at that point in my career but no that's like a master's degree and additional certifications yada yada eventually i want to do that but not anytime soon so. okay but <laughs> just for clarity's sake <laughs> um but yeah um i've been an rn for um almost three years and uh yeah I graduated and got my license in 2019, the very end of 2019. So excellent timing on my part. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I like bartended through school. The irony being that my last bartending shift was like March 16th of 2020. (laughs) Wow. So like out of one fucked industry to another one, (laughs) you know, it's crazy. Yeah. So like, I think the pandemic was announced four days after that March 20th, right? Yeah. During that shift was like, I, you know, or the 18th or something. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. During my shift is when like, Cause that was the weekend of like flatten the curve, go home on Twitter and everything. And nobody knew what they were doing. And all of a sudden everybody's an epidemiologist, I guess. And uh, so it was like, normally, you know, when you leave bartending, you post on social media and all your friends come throw money at you, you give away drinks for free, the whole, the whole bit. But of course it was like, I don't think I should be promoting that necessarily. Yeah, so like, yeah, yeah. 
you know, and there weren't a lot of people out at the time. So it was like four or five friends, all of them who worked in service industry or something similar. And at one point, all of their phones glowed because it was like de Blasio telling everyone schools are closed now. Yeah. And uh, bars, restaurants, gyms, movie theaters, you guys have 24 hours. Make it count. Go. So everybody looked up at me and was like, I don't think I have a job. And I was like, well, I don't work here anymore. So all these drinks are fucking free. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It was a weird night, though. That's wild. So, okay, so tell folks, so okay, so you, you became an RN 2019. Yep. And go ahead. Okay, so then I, my background was in, like, um, I worked for in abortion care for a long time, many years as a medical assistant and as an RN, um, as shortly. But then I switched to harm reduction services, which I really believe in strongly, and that's, you know, that's a whole can of worms. But, um, yeah, in the end, with uh, all the changes during the pandemic, I jumped around a bunch. I ended up in the nursing homes during the first week of April in 2020, and that was as bad as it sounded. Um, I ended up doing some, like, uh, where did I go after that? Oh, the like the vaccine tents, the, the f- testing tents, those w- with lines, you know, wrapped around the block, walking into, like, temp jobs next to, like, mobile morgues. It was really awful. Uh, watching a lot of people pass away was really difficult and I didn't see it nearly so much as like shout out to the real to the real heroes like the respiratory therapists and the crash teams across the country because that was some real real traumatizing yeah. shit yeah um, but then in, I got offered my first hospital job in uh, Brooklyn which was in the psychiatric emergency room or we call it CPEP uh, which stands for comprehensive psychiatric emergency program been there yeah done that I was in CPEP <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I shouldn't say that in a bragging tone. no I like it <laughs> been there been to CPEP yeah <laughs> it was uh, in DC they took me there and uh, it was rough but honestly like I feel at the time that's where I needed to be you know, at least for yeah. a couple of days. But. Can, yeah. Tell me more about it. Like what was how many like did you share like a room with other people? How long were you there? Well, they had they had I was I honestly I don't s- totally remember everything Which about makes it because I was pretty manic and then they had me pretty heavily medicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember getting arrested. And so it was like when you get arrested, it's either they're going to take you to jail or they're going to take you to that place. Yep. And um, neither are great options. <laughs> both uh, are bad. <laughs> both are bad. But I remember they would give certain people would get a room and then other people would be in sort of more of a communal kind of like sleeping space. Like it would just be like almost like a, like a hospital room with a few beds next to each other. Right. You know? um, but I remember they had good they had good breakfast sandwiches. They really? <laughs> I've never heard that about hospital I mean, food. I mean, I, I know it usually <laughs> wasn't, but they had these it had these like Jimmy Dean like a uh, little sausage patty Ooh, thing. Look at that DC money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, I don't know why I remembered that. I like it. I'm <laughs> glad somebody has one good thing to say about hospital food. People don't realize we can't put like salt and stuff in it. Yeah, the food is usually <laughs> terrible at hospitals. It's the worst. Well, we can't give you a heart attack on our watch, so it's got to be the most bland bullshit bullshit ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the worst. But but yeah, I was there, and it's like, uh, and I think it was kind of like. You'd have to go there um, before they would could find like a more permanent place for you to go. Right. You know what I mean? Like, let's say you needed to go to the psych ward for some amount of time. Like an in, like an inpatient admission. Like an inpatient admission. CPAP would be sort of like the uh, the holding sort of like uh, area before you would get there. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. I mean, and, and you worked there. Yeah, for a year, and I swear, like. <laughs> at a certain point like I mean and this was also remember you know this is summer of 2020 to 21 um so like June to June and it was you know at the time New York is still completely closed and then like come the winter you know everything is way like you you know you can have a beer outside with your friends but now it's six degrees outside and you know I just remember that winter as like people sh- shivering in out in backyards saying like this is fine it was not fine yeah. but you know we were yeah. just convinced willing ourselves to believe it was fine because we missed our friends and wanted to see them in a way that was safe, right? Yeah, and we're social creatures by nature. Absolutely. And as know? a diehard extrovert, I was going crazy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I know that word is loaded, but I say that as a person who is, yes, like you mentioned before, I have my own diagnoses. I've also been a patient in a CPEP before, which yeah. is why I took the job, right? Like I thought I'm perfect for that, right? Like I've seen both sides of it. I can like you'll advocate the, for change. You'll I can have the compassion and the empathy. Right. And I think the nature of, I mean, like we're going to, I'm sure we're going to dig into this, but like I, I left that job with zero moral clarity 
on exactly what I think about whether it's like right or it's wrong or like what could change or like what's better. At, by the time I left, I could have had a therapist literally for like my life and then a whole separate therapist for my job. Like I, and I probably would have seen that person two hours a week. Um, I couldn't afford it because <laughs> yeah. public healthcare system is pretty fucked. Right. Um, non-existent, but, uh, wow, that's interesting. So that's so interesting to say you do not have moral clarity. So basically it sounds like it's an all around complicated, fucked up situation with no easy answers. Exactly. And like, I think, I think I've been told this by colleagues and by friends, but like, I definitely feel like I'm somebody with a very, like I have a true North in my moral compass. Like it is not like, it's not hard for me to, and like, I, I always apply my, my ethical compass to everything. Right. Like I think it's part of what makes me a good nurse. And I think people open up to me because they know I'm not judgmental. And like, I think it's part of my essence as a, as a creature, right. Like considering like my work in harm reduction, I'm very, I'm very dedicated to that from my own, you know, personal and family history of things like, uh, like substance abuse, HIV and AIDS, like all of all and how abstinence culture can be so harmful and also save many people's lives. Right. And like the same with abortion, like I have a true North, right. And with CPEP and its, and its function and its structure and its implications, I have left it after I left it after a year with literally nothing but question marks. And that to me, like it, it's just an unusual thing for me to feel like I, I know that there are way worse ways we could be doing this. Like for one, like you mentioned, like when people get arrested, yeah, exactly. You have, when you're in police custody, they get to make this call, right? If you're, if they decide you're not like in psychiatric distress, then well, they're just gonna throw your ass in jail, right? If they do decide that you're in like in mental health crisis and they bring you to the CPEP, well, <laughs> I think that being in CPEP is just about the only thing that would make a person in psychosis go crazier. Like, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think different ones are different. You oh, a hundred percent. I've been, I don't want to brag, but I've been in a bunch of psychiatric hospitals over the years. <laughs> I actually, I actually have a joke in my act where I say like, where I just, I just say, straight up say on stage, I've been in the psych ward or whatever. And sometimes people will, if I do it in a non sequitur way after a bit, sometimes people just laugh because it's so like out there, you know, <laughs> uh, just to acknowledge that like in a non sequitur way. Right. But sometimes people will kind of clam up a little bit. So I yeah. go like, I know that makes people feel uncomfortable, right? but it's no big deal. Over the years, I've been in the psych ward very infrequently in five states and two countries. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., California, Colorado, Ireland. If I get four more stamps on my frequent insanity rewards card, I get a free cup of coffee. <laughs> Served to me by the ghost of Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, my right? goodness. <laughs> and, and then I talk about and then I talk about how. When I was in uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., that's actually where John Hinckley Jr. was for a long time. Oh, cool. Did you guys cross paths? He was already released. Oh, but what I say is, I go, Maybe it's next like, time. he's the dude who shot Ronald Reagan. So I go, like, it's really disturbing because it means I'll never be the coolest person to have been <laughs> in that hospital. Oh, uh, well, that's and awesome. <laughs> not even the coolest person named John. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that was a little tangent of me doing some of my act for the podcast. I hope that's okay. But, uh, he what was I, supposed to play Market Hotel recently. Did you see that? I did. And they those cowards canceled oh, it. Oh, they did? I heard it was oh, sold yeah. out. No, they can't. Well, they canceled well, it. It was regardless. sold out. Yeah. People keep telling me. Keep, keep Their telling apology me was that. bullshit. I encourage all of you to go to Market Hotel's apology on Instagram. It's piss poor. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. So I, uh, but anyway, and there's there's been some hospitals, psychiatric hospitals that have been terrible. They're always pretty bad. But mm -hmm. there's been some that have been better than others. Oh, you know what sure. I mean? And even within the city, there's there's a there's a there's a wide range. Very. Um, and and I think sometimes and I, and the and the CPEP in D.C. was it was I did not enjoy being there, but looking at it now, it was it was not that bad. And have you ever been to a public hospital CPEP? Like so for here, those of you in New York, that would be the health like New York City Health and Hospital uh, HHC hospitals. That's so. That's Bellevue, Woodhull, Kings County, Jacoby. What am I missing? I was in Elmhurst. Uh, Metropolitan Elmhurst and Elmhurst Queens Hospital are bad. all HHCs. Elmhurst, I found to be very, so very bad. Here's where we get into capitalism, and it's awful, <laughs> and, and, and it's awful um, reaches into the world of healthcare where it shouldn't. Right? We all know that. I mean, it shouldn't exist, but it does. And basically, so those public hospitals, right? This is another. This is. I'm so glad we're talking about this because I, I, 
say this stuff all the time. Um, but like, I I'm sure if you've ever heard uh you've if you uh, if you've ever been into New York in New York City and known somebody who's had to go to the hospital, which is likely, uh, you will always hear people joke about tattooing like on their chest and if they're in Brooklyn, like anywhere but Woodhull, right? Like that's a common thing you hear. And I want to be very clear when I say that, like. I 100% believe when people tell me that they have horrible experiences in those hospitals, I believe it completely. They are so massively underfunded. And those nurses, those nurse to patient ratios, which like California controls by law, right? So they have to hire nurses because it's against the law to assign, you know, and it depends on the department, right? Like in ICU, nurses want, it's one patient, or sorry, it's two patients to one nurse maximum. In psych, it might be like in an inpatient psych, it might be like one to eight you know who are like mostly stable but at, basically that's again in california regulated by law welcome to new york city where we have been destroying hospitals to build condos for years and that really came to bite us in the fucking ass yeah yeah like uh closing hospitals like getting rid of hospital beds all sorts of stuff shrinking like, nursing programs uh making that was all pre-pandemic oh stuff. yeah and it really came back to us yeah and uh and that was cuomo and de blasio mm-hmm, and i mean and also the ghouls that came before them yeah um but uh and, and any real estate, really, it'll, I think all that blood is on the hands of the real estate, you know, yeah. uh, moguls in this country. But uh, and for I guess some are not even here and they control the city. Um, but the point being that, like, these h- public hospitals, I'm not trying to excuse like anybody's like a- I'm not trying to like wipe away or make excuses for people's horrible experiences in those places. I, again, 100 percent believe them. Those those are earned. Those are like the reputations are earned however i really don't think it like i don't think it lies at the feet of the nurses and the doctors and the ancillary staff who are massively underpaid thank god they're in they're in unions they show up every day and do it anyway and when they you know when they do this for like you know 28 fucking years like i knew nurses who were there for 28 years and it will beat the compassion out of you and it is why i had ultimately i was like worried that i would become that dispassionate and like that person who just sees a crazy person right like who doesn't see a person at all who like you know like that they're not humans or something like I I couldn't be that and like I'm definitely not saying that all the nurses there are like that because that's not true there are some of the most amazing big-hearted patient compassionate people that I've ever known there and then also the working conditions are so fucking horrible that I don't blame anybody who got salty who's been kicked and stabbed and like all kinds of stuff because I I got a lot of injuries in the CPEP you know like uh, it happens a lot um and that is not the person the sick person's fault but like the the nature and the structure of the care that we have that we exist in now it that does kind of create those those unsafe working conditions for those people and like that has consequences and I hate that like in order to get like better care you have to be able to access private hospitals right like so that's your New York Presbyterian your Northwell Health your uh what's the other big one <sighs> Lenox Hill Yeah they're yeah they're an institution been around forever but the thing is like Northwell like it's buying up a lot of hospitals and Presbyterian too they're they're also becoming hyper normalized like into these like vertical structures that own like every single thing like there's basically two big corporations that own every private hospital in the city and they fight it out for e- between each other and then now they own independent outpatient clinics right that you see like Lenox Hill has like an outpatient radiology that people come from like my current practice to to get like you know x-rays done when they have knee pain right um, but now also insurance companies are buying um, whole chains of uh, like Walgreens and CVS are owned by Aetna and by United Healthcare they're eventually you're going to have to go to the same owned pharmacy clinic hospital and if you end up at the wrong one well i guess fuck you you owe twenty two thousand dollars for having the gall to i don't know make a child and like try to have a family in this fucking world like that is the future the dark visions of the future is all you're gonna get from me holy Um, shit uh (laughs) that's all you're gonna get from me so i i again strap in psychos (laughs) we're finding out about the uh evil corporate consolidation of the uh, healthcare world (laughs) to a a new level of fucking insanity. So, Sid, I was, the last hospital I was, so I, you know, so I, November 2020, or like October, late October, November 2020, I was like falling off the rails. I was really stressed out. It was, you know, it was kind of like height of pandemic time and things like that. And uh, I ended up having to go to the hospital and I ended up at Gracie Square. 
mm-hmm. um, which I thought was interesting. It was like, it was, I mean, they were certainly under resource and stuff like that, but everybody was trying to make the best of it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it didn't feel dangerous in there. I'm um, so glad to hear that. You know? Uh, and, uh, and I mean, so I thought some of the doctors were kind of shitty. I thought the psychiatrist was kind of dismissive or whatever. We can get into that stuff later. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, uh, have you heard of Gracie Square? You know, I actually haven't. Is it near like Gracie Mansion? I'm guessing. Uh, it's, I'm pretty sure it's like either the Upper East or Upper West Side oh, sort okay, of yeah. area or something like that, but it's small. And, uh, it was funny cause when I walked in downstairs, like the, uh, the uh, I guess the waiting room or whatever or like the the uh, administrative entrance was very was re- renovated and looked like very nice and like modern. Oh, that's good. But then but then you took like the elevator up to the ward and it was just not. <laughs> it was like the same as every other one. That paint job was old, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. still a little bit of lead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it was funny. Like they put like the facade downstairs. You oh, know yeah. I mean? For your family to come pick you up and see. how nice Yeah. It looks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. That was that. But for the love of God, I really think I am uh, I'm optimistic that these days are behind me. Um, but who knows? But anyway, go ahead. Well, I think I mean, I'm really glad that um, that you have found. I know you said earlier, like there were times when you were found yourself in CPEP that you were said, like, this is where I needed to be. And I'm glad that, that I only see that after the fact, not well, during the fact. You know <laughs> what I mean? And also the CPEP I was in in D.C. was like it was relatively small. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't I I have a feeling what it was compared to the one that you worked at are, is is different. I worked at a very large hospital um in the it's an HHC in New York City, so it's a public hospital and it was a very it was a huge campus. Um it's it's What's a, HHC? That's the New York City Health and Hospitals. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, that's just another acronym healthcare loves acronyms um but yeah just isn't it's a large public hospital and i don't want like want to for the sake of you know privacy i'm not going to say exactly which one but it's a large public hospital here in new york and it is a trauma center in the medical side like it's it's a level one which means like they can handle anything like i think it's funny when people get anywhere but woodhull or like tattooed on themselves because i'm like if I get stabbed or shot, do not stop at red lights and take me the fuck to Woodhull, to Kings County, to Bellevue. Do not stop. <laughs> I don't need your NYU Langone. I need the people who do this all the fucking time. Yeah. And like, not to, I'm not trying to stigmatize those areas, but like, sincerely, these are award-winning hospitals when it comes to these kinds of like, these kinds of injuries. And so I, I, again, the mistrust and the reputation for poor care is, I agree, probably earned, but also they can also be like award-winning hospitals. I think it's funny when people are like, I had a bad time at the hospital. I'm like, yeah, no shit. You're in the fucking hospital. It's not, it doesn't stand for hotel. That's something that people need to understand as well. A hundred percent. Although that's not just psych. I mean, all of them. Yeah. All, all units in a hospital. Although that being said, St. Patrick's Psychiatric Hospital in Dublin, Ireland was a fucking dream. Really? Yeah. Well, I, you know, so I somehow don't find that all that surprising because it's the Irish get a lot right. <laughs> yeah, they had so much outdoor space you could go to. You could walk outside into nature. Uh, they had like pottery. They had um, a miniature golf situation. Oh my the god, food, that sounds nice. <laughs> the food was good. And at the time, I don't know if they still would do this, but they let you smoke inside. No, I'll get out. Which was the Take best. Take me there. Yeah. It was like, yeah. And everybody in Dublin smokes a cigarette called Johnny Walker Blue. That's no, no, no. Johnny Player Blue. Oh, my God. I was going to say yeah. the whiskey, co- the scotch companies really diversify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> not no, not the whiskey. Not Johnny Walker Blue. I meant to say Johnny Player Blue. Ooh, I like it. And, uh, it sounds like a I, popper's label. Yeah, it does. <laughs> And I brought that up to an Irish person that cigarette the other day, and he was like, "Oh, I haven't <laughs> thought about those in forever. Oh yeah, that's so Dublin. I you love it. I mean? um, but yeah, uh, you're right. Hospitals are not a walk in the park. They're not. They're not a hotel. If you, you were know? having fun, I would be like, "What's wrong with you?" That being said, I do. I do agree with you that Woodhall is like, uh, you know, in certain things that they do an amazing job. Mm-hmm. But holy shit, does that building look scary? Yeah, the yeah, it's true. And I mean, the building looks fucking horrifying. Yeah, it does. It's true. The the other thing about New York specifically is we definitely are again, like not even just with the closed hospitals over the last like 20 years or so. We don't have enough beds for the size of our city, which means they have to shove out and dis- and discharge people who may not be ready to be discharged because they have somebody who's way more acutely ill in the waiting room. Right. There are you know, there are max capacities. 
And I mean, oh God, we, and I haven't even thought of this. We have to talk about what happened last year with like the person who, or this year, I guess the person who pushed that woman was discharged from Bellevue multiple oh, times since that happened within only a couple of months. And a psychiatrist note from a few years ago even said in his note that quoted the patient saying, it's only a matter of time till I push a woman onto the tracks, word for word. That is a psychiatrist covering his ass from liability right there. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to assume he's a man, but let's be really probably is. And the reality of it being, I want to make, I don't want to stigmatize people either. Like, Obviously, with mentally ill people, they're way more likely to be victims of crime, especially violent crime, than to commit one by a, vi- a ma- um, by a big difference, right? They're more often victims than perpetrators. And certainly not all mentally ill people are violent. And not all m- violent people are mentally ill, right? Th- all that being said, like, because Bellevue is a, also a forensic psychiatric ward, which means they have a court on site. There's a judge on site. Well, they're probably on Zoom these days, but you get the point. That means that for people who are, th- that people who are also facing charges, right, that, that's why they have to have that on site so that they can be, you know, evaluated for mental capacity, you know, yada, yada, legal. So I'm, not a, I'm not an attorney. I just, you know, law and order raised me, but that's about it. Um, yeah. But like, so in the instances where you see violent crime or something on the train, right? Like, you know, if there's like, for example, somebody gets stabbed on a train, right? The person who's stabbed, they bring them to the medical emergency room, right? Well, the person who did the stabbing usually ends up in CPEP, right? Because chances are <laughs> that's just, you know, if somebody's brandishing a knife at a random subway station. Like they're going to just bring him to us probably once they subdue the person or once, you know, whatever. And I'm without touching too much on the flaws the fatal flaws in policing because that would be, I would never stop talking. Um, It's a whole other podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I'm definitely not like the world's expert on it, but obviously a cab. The uh, point being that like that person is a person, right? And they deserve care. They deserve care that sees them as an, an ill person who needs help. Right. I don't know that psychiatry can really handle what it is that it's tasked with doing. Right. Like you mentioned, that you're heavily sedated, right? Like, so people experiencing mania, people, you know, we're talking like speaking in tongues or like trying to actively hurt staff, right? Or actively hurting staff. Um, those folks, th- we do have to put them into restraints, right? We do inject people with drugs that we use to sedate the person, hoping that when they come back, right? Like, I shouldn't say come back. They're Obviously, they're still alive but once they you know usually sedatives make people fall asleep and sometimes for very long periods of time we're hoping that when they wake back up those neurotransmitters have evened out to a more even keel and that we can actually talk to the person right like that that person is no longer experiencing these like delusions or hallucinations or they're not they're no longer in that like hyperactive state that can hurt that can cause harm to themselves and to others right because the both the most psychiatry can really do in an acute sense is hope for the best right? Try to put pause on whatever chemical stuff is happening in the brain. Cause it's not, it's not like other medicine, right? HIV drug assisted treatment. We draw your blood. We look at your urine and say, Oh no, look your kidneys. They, they need help. We can't give you this drug cause it'll hurt your kidneys even more. We'll try this one. Right? No such thing in psychiatry. There's no way to like necessarily scan your brain and say, Oh look, that's just a little too much serotonin. Hmm. You know what we should do? It doesn't work yeah, like that. Yeah, you yeah. know, but you, we, we both know this as people who would take medications and have for years. Like, it's like a dartboard. They start you, like, if you're depressed, they start you on sertraline, right? Okay, well, we'll go on to the next one. That's a talipram. You know, like, they're just throwing paint at a wall, hoping that something will work and that it hopefully doesn't destroy that person's ability to live their life, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like it and it can take a long time to find the right cocktail, as they like to call it. Of course. And it's the sort of thing where it's freaky because and this this used to freak me out more than it does now that they don't understand the mechanisms that make the medication work. Oh, yeah. uh, Which is troubling. (laughs) But then I turned a corner. Yeah. (laughs) You may disagree with me on this, but I turned a corner a little bit on and I was like, yeah, fair enough. That sucks. But hey, at least it works. No, I definitely understand that perspective and like um i'm thinking of a of a person i used to know who um they were in they were they were in the sex industries like they were they were a porn performer when i knew them and um they told me once they trusted me with this information so they they suffered from a very very strong depression that was like they were low-key actively suicidal like virtually every day right and they were on the largest dosage of prozac i'd ever heard of in an adult and i was like 
what is that like for you? You know, it has, it's often known for it's like, it doesn't affect everybody, but like the sexual drive or like, you know, the ways that a decrease in sexual drive can affect things like your ability to enjoy sex, right? Like through lubrication, through orgasm, et cetera. And this obviously would have most likely a massive, you know, uh, for somebody who that's their job, like that's a massive, yeah. that's a massive asterisk. Um, psychiatrists love to downplay this. Uh, they'll say, oh, well, there's like a little bit of a sexual side effect. Like you may not like sex anymore. And I'm like, sorry, that's um, that's a, huge. That's, that's kind of huge. <laughs> that's like life stuff. Yeah. That's like huge. That's the lowest rung on Maslow, right? Like yeah. along with shelter. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> which, oh, that's a whole other thing. But, but I asked this person, I was like, is it worth it for you right like this having to choose this side effect over you know maybe whatever it would do for benefit you in your you know in your labor conditions and they said listen I am so tired of feeling like I want to die all the time that this is a hundred percent my choice and I absolutely prefer it It, you know consequences be damned at least I don't want to fucking die and I you know that really stuck with me it always will like that kind of and I mean people do have a right to make a choice right like I know that like like I take Wellbutrin, and I know that for me it helps on both my ADHD diagnosis and it helps with my anxiety and my depression and a little bit my eating disorder stuff too. Sometimes it makes it worse. But anyway, I also know that it decreases like your your seizure threshold, right? Like I want to monitor I want to monitor how much I'm like drinking because I like to drink that I don't want to encourage. Like I know that I'm at greater risk for that if I were to overdo it. So like and I know that, but that's why I make that choice because it makes my daily life better. Right. And it makes it so that I can get out of bed in the morning that I feel like I can like at all, you know. Yeah. And I think that people need to for some people, medication is part of the picture. It's not the whole picture. Absolutely. I think that for some folks, it should be more of a last line of defense compared to a first line of defense. And I think or and I think sometimes if somebody's in a really fucked up position, they can be on meds and potentially they can get other things in order, other aspects of their mental health in order, and then decrease or even go off the medication. A hundred percent. You know, and I think it doesn't have to be lifelong. It doesn't have to be lifelong. I think for me, I've just had so many manic episodes and some of them have been so extreme and I've really tried I really tried the alternative route like the yeah, uh, you really have you've put in all the work and I, and <laughs> that's, I, that's and I still there. exploded, you <laughs> yeah. know, so like. Now I've taken a lot of the positive things from holistic treatment and I still do them combined with the, uh, you know, psychotropic drugs. Um, and I'm on like I'm on such a low level of lithium personally that it it barely registers in the uh, therapeutic range. For oh, wow. My, for my blood um, because my psychiatrist is like, yeah, that's OK to do. Yeah. As long as you're OK. And, and it's and it's supplemented with a little bit of Lamictal. OK. And a little bit of Abilify. Um, Interesting. A lot of people say Abilify does nothing for them. I've heard psychiatrists. I'm on I'm this. on five milligrams of it. Yeah. That's like you know the lowest I mean? adult dose, isn't it? Yeah. So I don't know. But it's like if I can on, like said, if I can stay. And I think I might have even said this in the intro. If I can say as creative as I am right now and have my energy level be the way it is and be as engaged as I am. Um, I'm just, I feel okay with that. Yeah. You know, I don't know. So there's always part of me that is like, maybe I could do all of this without the medication. I've just gotten sucked into the, uh, pharmaceutical industrial <laughs> complex. And I fucking, it's such a paradox to me because I hate big pharma so much. It is such a paradox. I know that they don't care if we live or die. Yep. I truly believe that. And they love to profit off of they it. They love to profit off of especially it. Especially Gilead. Fuck you, Gilead. Fuck all of them. But especially Gilead. That was Donald Rumsfeld's. Okay. And they create the, they own every HIV medication and prevention. They are the only ones in the game. Well, fuck them. I'll see that bitch in hell anyway. Rumsfeld, I'm coming for you. Yeah. The unknown unknown. (laughs) Freak. Sorry. Just have to say that. Yeah. There's a documentary about Rumsfeld called Unknown Unknowns where you just hear him being interviewed and he's completely just unhinged about talking about, uh, his legacy and talking about the invasion of Iraq and the fake weapons of mass destruction. Unknown, uh, unknown unknowns is an interesting documentary worth checking out. Psychos. Um, but yeah, I, uh, the I paradox. I really, I just, I can't, I, ca- yeah, I just can't square that, you know? It's hard. And I, I really, I really identify with that personally. Cause like, um, I definitely agree that like, you know, especially with with mental health, but also in really any kind of health 
the approach cannot simply be we only take pills, right? And it also can't be we never take pills or vaccines or anything else, right? We don't, what, you don't want to use prevention? You don't want to use, like, because that's what you're talking about with this, like, sub-therapeutic range. You're saying this, for me, allows me to have this much, like, creativity and this much energy and I feel good here and I'm also getting this like benefit of you know having the control over those like those episodes Potential right Potential manic episodes because these manic episodes that I've had is, some is of your them diagnosis bi- bipolar one yeah oh man rough it is it has been rough some of these manic episodes have been so explosive it's like really yeah. exploded my it's life. wild there's and the one thing that one thing that like keeps me honest so to speak i don't know if that's the right word for it but that keeps me like i'm gonna i'm gonna stay on top of my shit is like you know i exploded a really important relationship with my partner you know like we were potentially we really saw ourselves being in for the long haul together and i'm not even going to talk much about it because i'm just not i probably already i'm just not because she doesn't want me to so i'm not going to very respectful um uh the only thing that i'll say is that I've realized recently, and this sounds, this is sad, that, and I said this on a recent episode, but I want to, I want to see if if this resonates or not resonates, but I just want to say it again because it's hard for me to say, is that I know that my actions caused her PTSD legitimately. Right. And like, I think I am dealing with PTSD from having Cause that to somebody that I love so much. A hundred percent. And it has the effect where I don't put too much energy in towards trying to see people because I don't want to hurt anybody. Well, you're still healing. Yeah. Yeah. But I I think that I need to talk about it and address it. I think the hard things, the things that feel hard to say are the most important ones too. When you're ready, of course. Yeah. But I think that's. And then the next step is uh, cannibalizing it for stand-up comedy. Oh, of course. Well, that's the natural, <laughs> <laughs> that's the natural process, right? That's what I've learned for, <laughs> from hanging out with comedians. <laughs> 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 wow, you guys really do hate yourselves. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, no, I really don't. <laughs> that's why I fit in with you guys. <laughs> oh, shut up! If there's anybody that des- deserves not to hate themselves, oh my goodness, it's you. Stop it. You do so I, much good in the world. I, d- I know you I'm don't. I know you don't like hearing people. that. I know, I know, I know. Um, Also, supporting people who, like, as far as relationships go, with people who are, who, who, if you are with somebody who's mentally ill, which, like, if they're alive, they probably are. um, But then, like, supporting that as a, because I've, I've been both the, I've been both the person supporting somebody else who was in the middle of a mental health crisis, and also the one who needed the support in different times of my life. I think probably a lot of people out there can say the same. It is really fucking hard to support somebody no matter how much you love them in the middle of that. And I think it's important to acknowledge that like people have burnout, right? And it breaks a lot of hearts and it's it's fucking hard. The same way that like living with mental illness is fucking hard. And like we don't we don't always come I don't think uh anybody comes out looking great in those scenarios. I think we're all flawed human beings really just trying our best, you know? And yeah, it's complicated, but I think Anyway, it just sounds like you're on the road to healing and recovery and like from from like something that is traumatic, right? Yeah, I I think I am cuz generally speaking I feel good and I feel very optimistic about this next chapter. Good. Um, you know, yeah. Um to quote Miriam Kaba, she's like a prison abolitionist. Uh hope is a discipline, right? It's despair is where we fall. Like these are my own words, but hope is a discipline is something I hold close to my heart as like in a world this dark, in a world, in a time like this, it is important that we, like, remember that hope, optimism, that's our job. It, it is our it is our discipline. It is the way we move forward. We cannot, we can't Yeah, if we don't despair. have optimism, we're done. Yeah, exactly. We're done before we even get started. And besides, who doesn't want to, like, I don't know a, I don't know a leftist who isn't ready for a big fucking fight, you know? Yeah. So, like, let anger light your heart on fire, but, like, let hope guide the way is, like, the only way we get through this and yeah. the only way we push f- push past this. That and sedition. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that plus sedition. <laughs> um, so before we move on to the next topic, is there anything else you want to say about uh, your time as a nurse at the psychiatric emergency room? Yeah, I actually, uh, yeah, okay. I do. I want to talk about some more of it. We could talk about plenty. Yeah, no uh, rush. Okay, cool. So what, what my experience, what one of the earliest experiences I want to tell this story and I'm going to make sure to I'm going to say say things as mo- as obliquely as I can to protect privacy for both like 
me, my colleagues, and also for like the for the patient involved. But so we have a person brought into the CPEP by police who's already um, they've they've handcuffed this person, right? And this person's pissed. The doors that are that like swing open, right? They're they're called anti elopement doors. I know people think it means elope is marriage. It means to run away. So like doors that lock when you walk in and then there's another set of doors that won't open until the other ones behind you are lo- are closed right like you can see them also at nursing homes for people who like when people are um, experiencing like memory loss and like get disoriented they have them there too for people in memory units the idea is like to make sure they don't run away right um, and that's important for people experiencing mania who have like or people in a lot of different forms of psychosis or people who are high on K2. I listen as a person who enjoys drugs myself. There's no good excuse for K2. And no, I know I did it once when I was manic. It was like it felt. Oh, like, God. It felt evil. It, it is felt evil. like terrible. It felt like sc- it was really scary. Actually, I had a little patient who was like sh- they were very short. They they crawled into the jumps into the drop ceiling in the CPEP. <laughs> the psychiatrist came in and was literally like because he was in the nurse's station is like in the middle and it's got like glass walls because, you know, people throw a lot of applesauce and urine jars and other stuff. Uh, <laughs> and so this person had, you know, the furniture inside the CPEP, it has like no hard edges, no ligature points or places that you can hook something in with which to harm yourself or hang yourself. Um, so there, it's all like soft, heavy furniture with curved sides. It looks like it belongs in a, like a, like a McDonald's, uh, playground area. It's a great way to put it. Yes. And, and they're really heavy so that it's hard to throw them. Yeah. People in mania and people in psychosis are fucking strong and yeah. people on meth are too. Um, <laughs> or, PCP, I've never really seen anybody like hulk out like that. But anyway, my point being, so this little person was able to stack all this heavy furniture. Like I don't, and again, this person was like probably under five feet tall and uh, stacked them all into a corner. And I just saw like all of the, the, you know, our, uh, our team that was there to protect us. Like they're like supposed to deescalate, which that's a whole other thing. But she was like literally in the corner of the room crawling into the drop ceiling. And this, like the saltiest psychiatrist who I'd never once seen smile walked in and he goes, what the fuck is happening here? And I said, have you ever seen the movie The Exorcist? I got that motherfucker to laugh. I was like, yeah, that's right. I'm funny. All right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if you're out there listening, <laughs> I got you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the whole point being this one patient comes in. They're in. They're already in handcuffs because the police have different rules and regulations on what they are oh, allegedly allowed to do to restrain people. Right. Um, RNs have different ones and they vary by state. Um, like if you know the old school things you see in the movies, like the, um, what are those jackets? The restraint jackets, um, straight jackets, straight jackets. Yeah. And like the padded rooms and the isolation, all that shit's illegal in New York. Um, now yeah. <laughs> the history of psychiatry is a dark one. Um, but certainly, uh, nowadays we still use four point restraint, which is where you tie down like each foot and each hand. Right. And, um, uh, when that happens, there is a max time limit in New York State for adults. It's two. It's in one hour. Every ten minutes, you have to write down and assess the person's like ability to like move their fingers, check for blood flow, make sure they're conscious. All of that's really, really regulated, and you have to document the fuck out of it. Like the doctor has to order it within a certain period of time. If it doesn't happen within that like two like a fifteen minute period, then basically like you've violated that person's rights. Um, so it's very highly regulated, which means a lot of paperwork. And frankly, I don't know that, and I'm not saying we should get rid of them, but I don't know that like, if you have nurses, doctors, psychologists, and ancillary staff, like filling out a ton of fucking paperwork that you're actually caring for that person's blood flow ability to move their fingers and their consciousness. Right. Like I think in the end, it means you are signing so many papers. You're not even looking at that person. Yeah. And that's the crazy bureaucracy of like the corporate takeover system. And I mean, it's, I mean, those are New York laws. And again, these vary by state. But, I mean, th- they're there to protect that person, right? But the, so are the nurses in the first fucking place. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying this paperwork and documentation shouldn't happen. But at this point, I feel like being a nurse is way less about offering procedures, treatments, administering things, and a lot more about documentation, which is so about covering of, your ass. Things are out of balance. Yeah, in my opinion, they sure are. But, like, this one person, I could tell they were wearing – like, they – I saw a tell when they were, because, you know, they search you, they make you switch into these really ugly pajamas, and, you know, everything is, they don't even give you a pencil. The pencils are flexible. I don't know how they do that, but, like, you know, good luck eating. Oh, <laughs> I've used those pens. It's like, I'll try, I'll try to write in the hospital with these, like, floppy little <laughs> yeah. little pen things. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're very hard to uh, maneuver. It's comical. And, I yeah. mean, honestly, too, it's like, 
you hear you'll hear any psychiatrist or therapist or social worker say like oh you know art therapy is so important and especially when you're stuck in a place where you have to share a tv with like 25 other people and it's like you know <laughs> like you should have the right to like i don't know write yourself letters write it or like be able to like color in a coloring book that maybe the only pages we ever had were like the were like biology ones that were like the bad effects of cannabis mm -hmm. and it's like okay i think that that person's probably going through a tough time how about hearts and flowers what about something that looks a little bit more yellow submarine than yeah. like black long i don't know that's just a concept i don't know but again that go i guess that goes down to funding <laughs> but <laughs> they didn't like they didn't ask my opinion when they bought the books so but um uh, anyway, this one person, so they come in, they search them, change them into pajamas. When they're searching them and emptying this person's pockets, I saw stuff that made me ask. I was like, oh, I think this person is trans. So I asked, because like they they're calling them by their legal name. And I said, hey, do you have a different name you go by? And they were like, yes, thank you. And this person is experiencing fucking psychosis. They're spitting. They're mean. The doors are literally shaking. And these are locked, heavy doors. They're like, yeah the whole point being that this person literally I, all I said was like hey do you actually go by a different name because I saw like their nails were painted and stuff and I don't know anyway so I asked them and they were like thank you they make eye contact with me right and they're like thank you I really appreciate that back to spitting and kicking and it's like that's okay I mean they're still in the same situation um but that person and I developed a quick report I was still really new I was still in training um you know shadowing nurses with a lot more experience than than I ever got there and that I have um and this person and I were able to develop a good rapport, right? And right before, because, you know, the, all the doors are locked. So in to enter and leave, like, you have to go through, like, a million anti-elopement doors in case somebody does get out, which people did all the time, so that they don't get into other parts of the hospital. There's, like, seven fail-safes for that. Still happens, but, you know. Anyway, so um, I had been, like in rapport or some in report or something like that in the other room and I didn't know what happened with this patient before the um behavioral health staff that are there to de-escalate um had like this person had been like literally throwing furniture and hurt somebody and I didn't know that so I come back in and I you know I lock I unlock the door lock it behind me go straight to this patient because I saw them yesterday I'd done their triage and I was like hey how was last night did you get any sleep like how how's it been in here and they were like fucking bad but I'm like okay and like I, I I think I'm okay I didn't know that they had just hurt a bunch of staff and that there the doctor had then ordered a sedative um, injection and I did not know that behind me 10 really big guys were putting on gloves and that the nurse with the sedation medicine in a, in a syringe was right behind me I'm just talking to this person they're in like a corner behind a wall I didn't realize what was happening behind me I just heard the patient look up behind me and go oh shit wow. and I heard n gloves on and I turned and I was like what the fuck why is this ordered I was like hold on this like this person's calmly talking to me like we don't need to give them a bunch of Haldol and out of van like they're totally safe and fine right now. They're making eye contact. They're making sense. We're having a regular conversation, but I didn't realize that they had really hurt like somebody was out for like over a week right before I'd walked in that room. And so, of course, this person is surprised because like when the doctors order it, first of all, psychiatrists, no offense, but cowards the nurses and the ancillary staff the, the less you're paid spend a lot more time and are a lot more likely to get hurt than those psychiatrists so when they order sedative medications and this really harsh way of administering them right because most people don't agree to it you don't want it um that they leave the room right who gets hurt is the lowest paid people on the ladder the people with the le le least access to education right to to advance their careers like people who want to be nurses and doctors but like come from families where that's just like impossible and here they are like getting kicked right like i i knew a, a woman who was pregnant and she got kicked in the stomach by somebody experiencing psychosis and she lost the baby oh god and that's not the worst one i've ever heard um i'm talking like and, ag and again i want to be very clear i'm not trying to say that like all people w who are mentally ill do these things these these people are really fucking sick and if we're jumping on them and sedating them when we're supposed to be their caregivers i don't really fault them for trying to hurt other people you what, know what i mean yes yes i do but and what is in that instance there, what's the what's the uh, alternative? I don't know. There's no good answer. I don't sometimes think there is. There's Sometimes there's just not good answers for this shit. Exactly. And, I mean, so in the case where somebody doesn't want the medication, which, again, is like 100% of the time, um, the big guys hold the person down, and then the nurse administers the medication in whatever way we're able to. And if that fight takes a while, I don't I shouldn't say fight, but if that ability to hold them still so we can give them an injection takes a while we have to you know it, you have to do it fast um because the, if the person's really strong we enough like we can't necessarily hold that person for a super long time but you want to give a safe injection 
but I mean, it's, I never went to nursing school to jump on people and sedate people and lock them in a door behind me, you know, like lock them in a room with other people who are also ill and also fucking pissed and being held against their own will. Granted, it might be right. Like you said, right. If that person was brandishing a knife at a subway station right before they came, it's probably best that they're there. It's certainly better than jail, low hurdle, but it's better than jail. Yeah. But like leaving that job, like, Drawing up medication in a room where the walls are literally shaking because the person who's restrained and in handcuffs and in NYPD custody is like making the the walls of the hospital literally shake. And like my hands are shaking because it's nerve wracking and I'm scared too. And like doing that, sometimes I would have to sedate people in like, I'm talking in the, the numbers of like, you know, like one time I did 22 in a 12 and a half hour shift. And that is a lot. Wow. Uh, that I was really, su- and one, sometimes they don't work, right? Sometimes we have to jump on people again. And I, yeah, I just ended up feeling like, like I worked in the department of corrections instead of, instead of in healthcare. <laughs> and it's funny cause uh, the first job offer I got as an RN was actually Rikers. <laughs> And so I thought about it because I knew some doctors who trained there and some really cool radical lefty ones too. Like um, shout out to Dr. John Giftos. Um, he was the medical director at Rikers until right before the pandemic. And I think we, I think I actually shouted him out on the last one. He was v- like he, any YouTube clip you find of like talking heads on news channels during that time, talking about compassionate release because people in prison were super exposed and needed to be released. Right. Like you'll see Dr. John Giftos. But so I know lots of doctors who trained there and I reached out to them. I was like, what do you think? Should I take this job? And one of them said to me, "Uh, it's tough as fuck. And it's, it's important work. Those people deserve care, but let it radicalize you because it's really harrowing. And I, in the end turned it down because they wanted me to get my own uh, malpractice insurance. And I said, I'm a nurse, not a doctor. And uh, my union's supposed to pay for that. They were like, you, they do, but you should have additional. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to pass. That's crazy. I'm going to pass on that. But then I feel like I ended up in a place that's basically Rikers anyway. Yeah. Maybe with a lower death rate, but not by much. Because, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stories um, about mistreatment that has happened. Like at Kings County in 2008, there was a woman who was um, on the ground dead for several hours and nobody noticed. Multiple nurses checked, like walked past her security guard nudges her with his foot in this footage i mean this is 2000 fucking eight this is not long ago and of course when that happened obviously everyone was fired and they tore the building down and then they built a new department that of course you know with that history is you know again it's back to that like that reputation that reputation's earned because they did it right and when people mistrust those systems because they can't trust them, it is our job as providers, as, as healthcare professionals, to earn that trust back. And I don't know that working in a place like that makes me feel like we are. It makes me feel like an extension of incarceration and the way that it bleeds into everything that we do, right? Like you can see, you can see incarceration culture reflected in everything from public education to hospitals. And I was like, I know that I represent these systems. Like I chose to be in a healthcare professional. And when I wear scrubs to people that have been harmed by people in scrubs, I will always look like that to them. And I will always represent that system, no matter how good of a provider or care professional I am. And I have to actively every day with every minute, with everything I say, try to earn that trust back as an individual. Right. And I take that very seriously. Um, and the, and also too, like, the racial implications of that whereas like i'm like a white cis woman like there are a lot of people who see me in scrubs and think something terrible is going to happen to them because something has right at the hands of somebody who looks like me and yeah i just take that part of my job really seriously and that um it's it informs like every choice that i make and essentially after 12 months in that position i i i could no longer like i could no longer do it like there was like times during a snowstorm where I was mandated to stay for 20 hours and I got a few hours of sleep and had to go back for another 12 and a half hour shift. Um, I mean, thank God for the unions. Um, but yeah, when, you know, thousands of nurses have left the profession in the last two years and a lot of people on like a lot of hospital administrators, you know, the suits, um, 
really like to paint, especially nurses, because I think there's like this so sort of like, a, you know, d- nurses are like dumber than doctors. The stereotype still persists. No matter how much people think we're angels, there's still this perception that the doctor knows better. Um, that I think I'll, that's bullshit. I mean, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, docs. Uh, <laughs> nurse, nurse power. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, the what I'm trying to say is like, over the time where a lot of nurses have left the profession, there a lot of hospital administrators are blaming it on, oh, you know, they didn't want the vaccine. No, it's the labor conditions. I'm sure some nurses turned down that vaccine. I'm sure, I know nurses who did. I know lots of people who claim to be religious, and I'm like, Susan, I saw you barf on set, you barfed on my shoes Saturday night. Now you're you're a Presbyterian, huh? That's hilarious. Or like you're a, you're a Christian scientist? Fascinating. Hmm. I wonder what the guy in the bathroom stall would have to say about that. You know, like I just, That's it's hilarious. funny to me, but like, and also whatever people do, whatever the fuck you want. Um, and I know doctors who turned down that vaccine too, but like for the, but for real, the reason nurses left the profession is because of the fucking labor conditions. And like, I think CPEP throws it into a really stark relief, but certainly it is not the only nursing job that has, uh, that has these implications that shares these kinds of, you know, injustices and ask of their, ask of the laborer to cross moral and ethical and also biological boundaries, right? Like I, nobody should be working for 20 hours. Yeah. That's, that's insane. Ridiculous. That's crazy. And it was mandated cause it was a, it was this weather event. So we're not allowed to leave our posts and oh, yeah. And it, you don't want a nurse who's been working overtime, right? Like the, there's a, there's a nurse facing jail time in uh, she was at Vanderbilt cause she gave the wrong medication. They, asked her to work an extra shift and floated her to a department she didn't work at. She gave the wrong medication and a person died. And yeah. And and now that obviously is not the first time this has happened, but it is the first time where she is facing jail time. She obviously lost her license years ago and you know, her career is obviously over, but now she's looking at jail time. Like Vanderbilt turned their back on her and now they have a really hard time hiring nurses. (laughs) I wonder why. Can't imagine. Hmm. This is wild. I know. So and this is such a wild situation. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm no, such a bummer. <laughs> it's okay. It's important to really understand what's going on. If we have any shot at reforming things, if we have any shot of moving forward in a better way, we really have to know. We can't just like live in the darkness about this stuff. Yeah. And I know that was a lot more about like nursing as a discipline and less about, you know, mental illness and its treatments. But um, obviously they're so connected. Of course. Right. Um but yeah, again, I preferred that the people that we treated were seeing me instead of NYPD. Yeah, I mean, I look, I was in jail in D.C. It was fucking awful. My God, I bet. It was a terrible experience. And I, I was like in like, I was in like the kind of like psychiatric wing of the jail, which is always better to be in. <laughs> to Probably. Because it's like it's more low key than like the general population. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was terrible. It was like barely enough food to eat, barely enough food to eat, barely enough. And like you had to stay in your cell. You had to stay in your cell 22 hours out of the day. Mm-hmm. They, left, they kept you in there. And then if you were there long enough, you could then earn to be able to go out five hours or something like that. Earn it. Yeah. But like it was uh, bizarrely, there was like it was all it was, you know, you couldn't go outside in that particular wing but they had like a half court basketball court thing so that was like a <laughs> saving nice. grace for me to be able to go play and do something yeah move um, around a little bit yeah but uh when i got transferred from there from the dc city jail to saint elizabeth's hospital i still was not thrilled about it but it was it in that in that particular instance it was a better place to be mm-hmm. but yeah there's there's total parallels between both of the places right you know and It sounds like you really were on the front lines of dealing with some people in really acute situations. And actually, now that you say that, yeah. But also, so remember that in the CPAP, everybody's all together, right? So the person who attempted suicide but is now medically stable but is literally just sitting on their bed trying to mind their own fucking business has people experiencing psychosis running into – we didn't have walls. It was just like the – like an ER has like the curtains. We had like 24 beds and – curtains right so there's a side for men and women quote quote um that uh you know these are not actual divisions like if somebody's violent and experiencing psychosis and hasn't been sedated yet that person's like running around tearing down those curtains like and then there's this person who's in there because you know they really they really attempted to end their life right and that person is not hyperactive but that person is around it and i don't see how that is helping fucking anything 
Yeah, that sucks. And then that the sucks. don't even start me on the children because we had a pediatric one too. And I always knew I didn't want kids, but now I know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, this is... Uh, also, too, trying to convince somebody who's experiencing psychosis to wear a mask. Not easy. No. <laughs> I got COVID shit. twice. <laughs> Unreal. What a... Uh, it's so hard because there's no easy answers to these questions. Right. Like, so what happens after people get in there, right? You are evaluated for whether you should be admitted inpatient for a stay, right? Those stays are sometimes, uh, sometimes they're court ordered, right? Or they're, or the psychiatrist, it has to be two psychiatrists in New York sign on to say like they have the right to, like they've taken away, they've taken away your rights to leave, right? They've decided that you should be admitted against your will. That is what the document says. That has a maximum, I think. That they have different ones. And I'm again, I'm not an attorney, but they have like four, 45, 60 day ones. And obviously, if you get better, they can discharge you sooner. But um, the reality being that uh, if you do get in, you do get admitted, right? Like they have different units for different stuff, right? Like so somebody who's got who's experiencing like like a psychosis, but also happens to be pregnant, like that would be one unit or like one for people who are elderly, right? Because that's a different set of biological stuff going on, too. Um or, or people in withdrawal, right? There's a lot of different stuff. But obviously, some people don't need to go inpatient, right? Like, a lot of those people get discharged. I had patients who, like, they were in home, in, like, residence. Uh, like, they lived in a residential space for people with their diagnosis. And those places have rules about when they call EMS, right? One place, there, there was, if you are experiencing audi auditory hallucinations of any kind, and you verbalize that to staff, they have to call EMS. This one patient, I can't tell you how many times I triaged that kid. Like, there were two days in a, in a row where I triaged, discharged, and then he came right back two hours later. And, I mean, that happened, like, for two days in a row. because, wow. And so, like, this person is ping-ponging back and not getting what they need really anywhere. And I don't know that either institution is actually really equipped to handle the fact that, like, some people do have auditory hallucinations and are totally fine, right? Like, they're not hearing commands. They are also, they are aware that they're hallucinations. They are in their, they're, they understand what they are and can, and, and probably hate them, but probably can keep going with, they can take care of themselves, right? Like, there's no such thing necessarily as, like, like, when we say, like, stable in psychiatry, it, like, varies so wildly from, like, like, somebody who is at one moment experiencing, like, mania versus, like, okay, now they're, they're, they've come back down and they're a little bit more, like, even keel, right? All of that, like, like, when d when do we decide that like because sometimes the symptoms don't ever go away or they might stick around for a long time right like um i'll share a self-disclosure thing so i had i had su such bad depression when i was a when, in a when i was like 18 that um i had like a i had a psychotic like episode and like had like psychotic delusions and auditory hallucinations it was really fucking scary um I almost never get them now. It has been a long time, but then when I'm like doing really poorly, I I can't, I do, I do still have them. They aren't words, but they're there and it's fucking scary and I know that they come back every once in a while and when I do I'm like, "Oh fuck, I'm not well." Like I I don't want to go back to the hospital or anything. I I know how to handle this, but it's like a constant reminder of like your illness no matter how like stable you might be, right? Like and yeah. in those scenarios does like that person knows the like that person that I triaged and discharged multiple times in a day, like they're okay. But these institutions are sending them to this emergency room where, again, people are pulling down curtains and, like, being, being jumped on. Like, who the fuck is that helping? Yeah. Who the fuck is that helping? Yeah. And I'm just totally livid about it. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I mean, you, you know, you experienced it. You did everything that you you were doing everything that you could to to try to bring compassion and energy positive energy into the situation but it's like but i'm also just one nurse in a really big chain of institutions and eventually i kind of realized that i couldn't really affect any change and that the job was slowly like killing me so i had to quit um i found another gig and moved on but yeah it, it will stay with me forever yeah does it feel somewhat i don't know cathartic's not the right word but somewhat of a a good venting, decompressing session 100%. to get to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, because I think, well, for especially you, you get it on so many different levels. And this is also when you're not talking to people who like are in healthcare or like are f comfortable talking about mental illness or t or comfortable talking about the way that we treat those people, right? Because it's so easy to just ignore. Cameras aren't allowed in hospitals. People don't know. 
yeah. right? The closest we get is like movies. Girl Interrupted, right? Like, Ugh. I kind of love that movie. No, I do too. But <laughs> I, I, I know I do love that movie. But I'm just talking about like I have trouble watching on-screen representations of uh, of oh, mental yeah. illness. One hundred percent. Yeah, like, I can't. I just I find them to be some. They can be very caricature. Oh, they're cartoonish at best yeah. and and offensive at worst. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree with you. I've never really seen a good representation of a lot of diagnoses on screen. One that I'm interested in that I that I couldn't watch that I turned off that I was like I can't handle this. But I'm not sure if it's because it was really bad or if it's because it was actually good and was resonating too much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really don't know. Which one was it? Is the character the brother of the brother on Ozarks, the brother of Helen Hunt on oh, Ozarks? I've not seen it, but I hear it's really good. In like the second season or something, towards the end of the second, the brother shows up and he has bipolar disorder. And at one point, he's like really agitated and he's kind of like yelling and creating this sort of scene. And I'm like. I can't watch this. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very relatable. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes, yeah, it's the thing like we were saying earlier about like the, har the hard things to say or like some of the most important things to say. Like yeah. it kind of feels like watching stuff that is really difficult to watch also might mean that like don't like might mean don't look away, but also maybe <laughs> do yeah. it. Look, look when you're ready. It's fine. Look when you you're ready. I mean? You don't need yeah. to re-traumatize yourself. Exactly. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't view myself as somebody who is often triggered, I which I think is interesting. Yeah. But I think maybe that did. I'm I'm very similar. I'm like the feminist with the hot take that I love rape revenge. It's like my favorite subgenre of horror. I think there's no such thing as like what should or should not be allowed in art, but your only responsibility th is that, that you have to do it well, right? Like yes. I am I have no problem with rape being in films. Obviously, I'm not saying everybody should see them. I'm saying this is my take on things and uh, as a woman who's experienced violence and at all kinds of things, I am not easily triggered, but when I am, oh damn, it's wild. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's interesting, right? You made me think of something I was talking to my friend uh, Ben the other day he's a comedian he was saying that he uh, like in terms of art he's, he thinks that he's more offended by something being not funny than it being like wrong to say a hundred percent if you're you gonna know? take the risk it better be fucking worth yeah, it yeah exactly exactly um, okay so we are doing so good. I know <laughs> you that you are such a good talker. No, I'm sorry. You're amazing. <laughs> no, um, I know it's probably like this is probably like a really long <laughs> recording. We very well may do this as a two parter. Oh, please, yeah, okay. no, please. Because be there's <laughs> more stuff that we got to talk about. Be forgiving to your listeners, <laughs> and also if you've made it this far, thank you. <laughs> Dude, are you kidding me? The psychos must love this stuff, right? Psychos, let me know. Email me at takeyourpillspot at gmail dot com. Let me know what you think of the Sid Casey episode <laughs> so far. Um, okay, so before we move on, anything else with the uh, with the uh, psychiatric ER thing Any that you want to say? I mean, you have said so. You have you have said, said a lot. A <laughs> Sorry, <good amount>. no. <laughs> I, I mean, this is like actually very therapeutic and cathartic. That's <laughs> amazing. Yeah, um, because it is hard for me to, I, like, again, I you know my background's like, you know, fucking, you know, it's like harm reduction. Like I talk about like overdose deaths and fucking injection drugs and stuff like all the fucking time and i talk about abortion all the time and i fucking talk about mental illness all the time i am wild at dinner parties i often mm. don't know like i think i am so grateful for the very like patient and kind friends who have told me like hey trigger trigger warning like we are at like a fancy steak dinner for a friend's birthday maybe now's not the right time to discuss the differences between you know like medicated like self-managed abortion and medication pills right like maybe that's not the time <laughs> and thank you to those of you who have i'm slowly learning yeah, so but know it's your <laughs> audience Sid. but it's so nice to like be able to actually talk about it because like yeah because the shit fucking matters and again like it's sort of like the same with the pandemic like when do you remember people driving by like hospitals and being like nobody's here all that shit all that shit and it's like well they're all inside and cameras aren't allowed like we have security footage obviously but like it's a HIPAA violation in every direction. It's like massive. Like, so you couldn't see the horror and I wish to God people could. Um, and that's why it's important to talk about this stuff. Like, you know, cause you've been on the inside. I have, I don't want to be on the inside anymore. I want to keep you out <laughs> of that so bad. Um, I really like, uh, I was sitting, I met in that chair that you're in earlier before you got here. And I was just thinking, cause my psychiatrist, she has said to me, she's like, she thinks that I can stay well. Yeah. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. And I kind of had like a sigh of relief. Just like 
maybe I can just stay well. I totally believe that you can. You're first of all, you're your own best support, right? You have like a really good handle on things and like you are like disciplined in the way that you care for yourself in more than a more than one way right like and that you foster your own creativity you have a huge group of friends and a community that loves you and supports you I think those are the honestly the ways that we keep people out of the CPEP uh, right like a lot of the people that we had in there were homeless and it turns out that um you know I just I saw a lot of like I guess I do have more to say the the uh <laughs> never run out of things to say um I think it's like f fascinating to me, like when I would be doing a triage for somebody, right? And it's like a black homeless woman who she uses uppers, right? She hasn't slept in God knows how long. The psychiatrist says to me to the side later, I think she's uh, experiencing paranoia, like paranoia to the point of it being a psychiatric symptom. And I was like, is it that or is she a woman who sleeps outdoors and has no shelter and takes medication or you know uses drugs in order to stay the fuck awake so nobody hurts her is that paranoia or is that a very real reality for like a lot of people who live outdoors people without homes right especially vulnerable people especially when we're talking about people f facing mental illness who are also like women or people of color that like are also over policed right it's it's like well if the police were going to take her to jail i'm glad she seems a little crazy so that she can come see us instead yeah. At least we give drugs. Yeah. Not yeah. meth, though, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, I just thought of a joke. I know this really funny psychiatrist. Um, so he's Kanish, if you're listening. Um, the uh, he said because I told him I went back to another job and I said he said, well, how how's it been in in CPEP for a year? And I was like, dude, I don't think I can do this. You know, I explain all the things I just said. And he said, oh, you are totally thinking of it all wrong. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like. In psychiatry, you get whatever you don't want. Do you not want to come to the psychiatric hospital? Too bad. Vo involuntary stay. Uh, you want a little break. You think you may not be safe at home, so you're going to come see us for an inpatient admission? Discharge immediately. If you come in and you say, I don't want your fucking medications, we're going to jump on you and give them to you in your arm. If you come in and say, I I'm really not well. I, I, I really think I need medication. Oh, you're drug seeking, so you won't get any. Oh my God, that's <laughs> hilarious. Because he told me that as a student in psychiatry that he was starting to realize this pattern and he was like, I learned it from somebody, you know, from like his teacher. And he's like, it helps you feel a lot better when you realize the way it works. <laughs> it all makes a little more sense. We're going to give you whatever you don't want. <laughs> that's hilarious. So listen, um, that is that is bleak and dark. Um so, Sid, what do you think about psychiatry? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think I think that with psychiatrists, um, first of all, I have a lot of respect for psychiatrists and doctors as well. I swear. It doesn't sound like it, but I promise I do. Um, I know there are really great radical psychiatrists out there who are fucking awesome and holding it down out there and have really good approaches. I also know doctors who are, you know, psychiatrists who... I swear, their only thing they do is prescribe sertraline, and that's it. Wait, what's sertraline? That's Zoloft. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's all they do. They're just Zoloft prescribers. Right. Would you like, oh, you feel a lot of feelings? How about we blunt a large part of them, make sex less fun, and uh, also, oh, if you stop taking it, well, it'll give you withdrawals. Uh <laughs> Tough withdrawals. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I stopped taking Zoloft and it was really fucking hard and confusing because I wasn't told about it. It was when I was like a teenager. Um, but yeah, then, you know, you have somebody come back and you say they say, oh, you know, I'm not actually like this isn't actually helping. OK, well, we go up on the dose. OK, well, that didn't work. So now we're going to try taking you off of that and putting you on a new one. We're going to try escitalopram, right? We're going to try whatever else. And you just keep throwing darts at this. And I mean, like we were talking about bef like you know the the whole point of it being like there's no blood draw you can do and say oh look john your blood says this you know what we know for people like in your position people with like this kind of blood chemistry this drug works the best at this dosage based on your height and your weight here we go like there's just nothing like that for psychiatry and i think often that psychiatrists will question a lot of like nursing clinical judgment and i'm like what you're not like you're not like a nephrologist. You're not some oncologist. <laughs> like I know they have deeper understandings of how medication works and are trained better on that than a lot of, than a lot of different professions and 
you know, on pharmacokinetics and stuff like that, they definitely have more education. But I think when it comes down to the practice of psychiatry, it often looks like, well, this is what works for most people, or this is what all psychiatrists start people on. But, you know, then they also gatekeep a lot of the things that people find really useful, right? Like, anybody out there who is a fellow ADHD person understands how hard it is to get medications and not appear drug seeking. Um, if you are honest with your psychiatrist and say that you've ever once tried like an upper like cocaine, like good luck getting that even like, even like a Wellbutrin or yeah. like, or even uh, like the lowest possible dose of um, Adderall, you know, it's just not going to happen for you. I think somebody told me that they couldn't get, the Adderall they needed because they one time like were honest with their psychiatrist and said that they smoked marijuana or yep. something like that. Yeah. Um, this is the part where I say, if you have to, to get your medications, lie to your doctors. I'm, I hate to say it, but like, that's like when, when I know people who are really struggling with ADHD and like, maybe they were on meds in the past, but they, you know, lost access, right. For a few years. And they're like, Oh God, I'm really fucking struggling. I was doing much better on that. I really want to try to get it back. Um, I always coach my friends and say, listen, you say you tried, you know, you tried pot a few times in college, but that it wasn't really your thing. And, you know, lots of people who use it, but like, again, never really picked it up because it's not your thing. Right. You drink occasionally only on weekends and special occasions. You have never tried a club drug. You have never had an issue with any of them either. Um, you've never blacked out and you've never had a hangover. Right. Like those are the things you have to say in order to get those medications because they do gatekeep them. And like the same way that like my psychiatrist, I do really like him, Leonard. Um, he was, re I was referred to him by a friend and uh, because I was told that he was like, he would, that he was actually a good about prescribing medications that you need. And this is true. So first meeting, first thing I was like, Hey, if you want to, cause like the first time I tried to find a psychiatrist in New York, he said, Oh, you seem awfully drug seeking. And I was like, sir, I live in Brooklyn. If I wanted drugs, I would go buy them. He said that to you. Yeah, he did to my face. And I was like, aren't you a psychiatrist? Like I'm telling, I even was like, I brought like, I had brought uh provider notes from my psychiatrist back in Austin. And she also had told me when I moved, like that if doctors needed to call her to like verify her treatment history with me, that they could. And so I provide all this information. This person still looked at me and said, you seem awfully drug seeking. And I'm like, I'm struggling. And I came to you for help. You know, I came to restart a therapy that I had been on for a couple of years that was working. And because my life is much harder now and I'm, re I'm really, I need them again. Right. So then I eventually f hear about uh, the one I see now. I go to him. Literally, we talk for my initial po appointment, probably like 30 minutes max. Right. Like that's a long psychiatrist visit. Most, most of you guys know out there that like with refill appointments, if you're pretty stable, they just go, you're doing okay. Cool. See you later. Yeah. And which sometimes, which sometimes is, is, it seems fucked up, but sometimes can be okay in the respect. Well, if you have to pay out of pocket for them and then they're, they're willing to only, they're willing to see you like once every two months instead mm -hmm. of one month. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you are stable. Right. That's like good. That's amazing. Yeah. You're, you know? you're on cruise control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also to like, psychiatrists are kind of famous for not spending a lot of time with people. Like I think one of the, and so listeners to this would, will all, all be very familiar with this concept, but like something I think I hear in out in the world a lot is people are like, people get very confused about what a therapist or a social worker does, what a psychologist does versus what a psychiatrist does versus a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Right. Cause psychiatrists are doctors. They're doctors who specialize in psychiatry. They're board certified to prescribe psychiatric medications. They are not board certified therapists. They are not board certified uh, holistic health practitioners. They're not dietitians, right? Like they are psychi they're psychiatrists and obviously they do have other training. But my point being that like when people like people will sometimes be like, well, do you like your psychiatrist? Because I'm, you know, I'm really struggling, really looking for s to getting into therapy. I'm like, well, you wouldn't get that from from him. And they're like, and it's just sort of like, uh, because it's such a, uh, misunderstood like therapy, a treat or like such a misunderstood form of treatment, right? This, this multi-pronged multidiscipline approach that we know is the only thing that really truly works that we've got so far where you're talking about like diet and, you know, all this like and creative outlets and as well as medication management and also processing um, the past and yeah. Processing trauma, mindfulness practice, all of this a hundred percent. Yeah. And you also like I mean? being able to 
er, learn healthier coping mechanisms, ways, methods of self self soothing, pro- processing your own emotions in a way that's like healthy and honest, and you know, uh, and that supports your day to day life, right? Yeah. Like all of those things. We know that that's how it works, but because because that's this big, you know, sort of like a web of different things, all with the patient in the center. I think there's like a really big misunderstanding in the world of like what a therapist does versus what a psychiatrist does. And that's probably the biggest divide. But also like if you ask, we had psychologists on staff at the psych hospital I worked at. And I honestly was like, I don't really know what they do because they can't write prescriptions and they're not therapists and they're not social workers and they're not nurses. I'm like, I don't really know what they do to be completely honest. They were some of, some of them were great. And I want to be clear that like definitely not all psychiatrists fall into this category of like, you know, writing scripts and seeing see you in 90 days right like that's not that's not everybody yeah i feel very lucky that i have a good psychiatrist who she really has, this really seems to give a fuck you know that's the most important thing is that they is that they give a fuck um and uh and yeah it's like when i have a session with her she will spend more time you know what i mean but but it's pretty it's, but they're infrequent which i also am fine with mm-hmm. because i'm you know i'm in uh I'm in a good place. Do you also have like a therapist? The last I I was doing the better help thing. Oh yeah. But I got burnt out on that. Um, she was good. She was also burnt out. The <laughs> poor lady. I know a lot of a lot of my close friends are therapists, and I don't know how they've managed the last two years. Yeah, she had so many clients, and everybody was in crisis. You Literally know? So, everybody. So it was. It, she was so burnt out. I would like check in with her. You know what I mean? <laughs> Every session I would be like, how are you? Doing? And she would tell she would talk about it. You know what I mean? She's like, I have another patient who I'm like really worried about. Yeah. 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 Which is like usually a therapist. When you ask them about themselves, they kind of are like, all right, let's get back to you. Yeah. You this is that's I mean? appointments about you. Yeah. That's what I always say. Yeah. 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 Um, but then I just felt like I wasn't I would just be there. And I'm like, I don't even have, I don't know. I'm just I feel like you're just like checking in with me. It doesn't feel like any sort of therapy. I'm not making any progress here. Mm-hmm. Um, That's real. So. I have to see about if I want to get a like a, a talk therapist again. It's a tough call. I mean, I know like I have health insurance, obviously, since I'm a nurse, although when I got laid off by a certain large abortion network uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, they res- they rescinded a promotion and laid me off and left me without health insurance when I had left my job for that job in the middle of a pandemic. We love to be actively suicidal for like 180 days in a pandemic. That's so fucking crazy. It was awful. It shouldn't in your, your insurance status status should never have to be married to your job. Like that's insane. It's basically the company store just, you know, now. And it wasn't always supposed to be that way. No. That was like, my understanding is the origins of that historically was after World War II when there was such a, like a boom in the economy and and there was such a there was such a call for employment that there was such competition uh. for employment. Um, no, there was such competition by employers to get employees. Oh, kind of like right now where no quote nobody wants to work, but it's like nobody yeah. wants to work for your shitty wages. Exactly, but this was this was the sort of thing where the workers had options, so. In order to entice people to work, they started doing the um, like sweetening the deal. Yeah, with like benefits and paid time with off, all of that sort of stuff. But it was, but it was like it was never meant to be a permanent solution because it isn't. It was never meant to be a permanent solution for healthcare, right? System, and know? the idea of like if you have a job that you are disrespected at or is unsafe, and you have to leave it, and now you have you have Aetna. But then your next job, you have Cigna. Well, what if you're a doctor that you actually like? Only takes yeah. Aetna. When I was working on Redacted Tonight, I had such good health care. It was like, it was awesome. I had like, it was like, it was a concierge care thing. Where you, Ooh, those are the new thing. People yeah. love those. But it was weird. It was like, it seemed like it would be relatively accessible because you just had to pay up front. And maybe not for everybody, obviously, obviously, but. You had to pay up front two hundred dollars. Okay. And if you could do that, then you got this concierge, quote unquote, concierge care mm-hmm. that you would go there. You wouldn't have to like, you know, you would oh, you you're, you would show up at your appointment time and be seen at that time. You could. They had like the. Um, I don't know. It was just. It felt like good care. It felt like I was like, wow, if this was the health care that people were getting mm-hmm. more broadly in the country, we would have mm-hmm. a good health care system. Right. And when you say concierge service, you're talking like as in like it's a practice that has like patient 
outreach coordinators, but also those people can help you get to your primary care, but also your psychiatrist who also know the podiatrist. Say you get a foot injury and they're all within like one house. Like, is that kind of the concierge service you're talking about? Because those are the big thing now. Okay, no, it wasn't like that. Like, it, Forward Health here in New York and, like, One Medical, I think, are the big ones. But well, one med- it was One Medical. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I guess it was that. It was the providers I know love it. Like, where they go for their health care, that's it. Th- yeah. That's what everybody says. Uh, they love it there because that's how they work. Do you think One Medical could s- be scalable? 100%. It just requires insurance companies to be pulled out of the equation. And that is a massive industry in this country yeah. with lots of powerful lobbyists. And that's the problem. Because one medical, when I had it, at one point, it it they had to drop me because of my health, ins- whatever my health insurance was, was trying to rip them off so hardcore <laughs> that they were like, okay, we're not accepting people with this insurance anymore. Yep. And then everybody at our job was so pissed. Yeah. Because it was like, this was like really good care. And then they made some sort of deal. And like nine months later, they got, we got the, we got the provider back. You really, you're, you're, uh, you're hitting a really important point that I think people don't understand. So you know how labor unions work, right? It's the idea that it's representation of a large group of people for co- organizing for collective power, meaning that the will of the of the workers, the people who do this work, is able to be enforced upon their employer, right? The idea that labor deserves all that it creates. Um, it can, because it's such a large group of people and because it is the control of, like it is literally the hands of like, say a car manufacturer, right? They, they can stop production, right? So the company leaders have to listen to them, right? That's how, the co- that's how the concept should work. Of course, it's not how it works anymore in this country. But essentially, that's, what, that's the kind of power that health insurance companies have. They are collective bargaining units. So say you're Northwell Health. You own like six hospitals in New York City and several in Long Island and a lot of outpatient clinics. You're a huge healthcare provider. I'm Aetna, Right. I'm the largest health insurance company in the country. Now, Northwell at Northwell, a, a cough drop on paper costs $14. That's actually true, by the way. I don't know if it's for Northwell, but I've, you can see the, you see it on Twitter. Like People will post the receipts, and it's literally $14 for a single cough drop in a hospital on an actual receipt. Now, it's because that's what they want to charge the insurance company, and the insurance company then decides what they give them back for it. Right, except it's even, it's even meaner. <laughs> um, so if you're uninsured and you get this bill that has $14 cough drops on it, not to mention how God, how much could, uh, how much could a IV for normal saline cost, you know, thousands probably. Um, but if you are not, if you are insured, say you have Aetna, the largest, it is the largest I think in the country. So Northwell health and Aetna have an agreement Aetna because they say, well, we have the most insured people in the country under our umbrella you want our business because we're the largest health insurance company in the country we want to be able to offer your services to our consumers you should cut us a better deal than say Cigna because they're so much smaller or if it's anything smaller than Cigna like the big three like then forget it you know and then that's like Medicaid and stuff comes in too, but that's down the line. But the whole point being that like, so I'm this massive company and I have all of these members, these consumers, you want to cut them a better deal because I'm so big. So we get a better deal than say the people who get united because they have a collective power that they are enforcing upon the hospitals who are charging them for their services, but say you want all of our consumers, right? Yeah. And we don't do the reverse of that, which would be using bargaining to lower prescription uh, medication prices. Right. Right. Or yeah. anything else. Um, or pay for behavioral health, anything like therapy is ridiculous in this country. And oh, and luxury bones like teeth. And you and I are both glasses people. Apparently, eyes aren't that important either. That's a different kind of health insurance than. Yeah, it's crazy. How, it's how so the crazy. fuck is that possible? It's nuts. And all the psychiatrists, everybody's out of network. Okay. Oh, Every psychiatrist <laughs> yeah. is out of network. The only ones that are not out of network work in like a a clinic setting and you can't get appointments with them. Right. Um, And you know what? I had a, I had a psychiatrist in DC who was sort of in and out of network. Right. Um, But it, but the, but, and so he took my, he took my insurance, but he was making like nothing. It was almost doing it to me as like a favor because he like liked me or something like that. You know what I mean? Maybe he was a compassionate provider. They do exist. Yeah. But I mean, it's not fair to him. Of course not. No. You know, he said, no, it wasn't just for me. It was like half of his clients 
were like would take he would take the this one he took this one particular type of insurance mm -hmm. you know what i mean sure and and then he would have a bunch of clients that were out of network you know what i mean mm -hmm. um but he was one of the only people that did that. One of the only doctors that even did that, which is a very cool practice. I know some. I know a dentist who does that here too, where he like he you know he makes good money from his insured patients who he gets his you know his costs reimbursed from the you know the uh, insurance companies. But then he also has like full clinical days where all, you know he does things for people who don't have health insurance at either free or very very low cost, right? things like getting your wisdom teeth out are extreme. That's like, that's really important. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it shouldn't be optional like for health insurance companies to cover that. Right. Or like the idea that like, Oh, you del you work for Uber or you deliver for like for Grubhub. Like we don't, we're not in charge of your teeth. Like you yeah. have good luck with that. Like, so what you just have impacted teeth and in get an infection, like that's fine by them, I guess. Like, yeah. And yeah, just, the con health insurance is evil, obviously, and a, and a huge part of my job now is arguing with them. Like, I, I work on gender affirming services and, and HIV care, so a lot of it is like prior authorizations. Like, I just have to call them and be like, like, because the doctor says, okay, she needs this medication. The pharmacist goes, okay, and the insurance pays for it. Sounds good. The doctor said she needs it. Cool. And then the health insurance companies go, we should ask your doctor again. Does she really need it? And then nurses and doctors have to call the health insurance company and say, Here's the diagnosis code. Here's the billing code. And yes, she needs it. Please fucking fill the prescription like I asked you to. Mm. As if like they would write something for fun. Yeah. Like if you've ever met a doctor, you know they don't write any prescriptions for fun. <laughs> yeah. Just try like <laughs> try getting an Ativan prescription without like the world's most serious panic disorder. Like a friend yeah. of mine told me recently that they got their doctor, their psychiatrist to give them like the like the it's like a 0.5 milligram dose of um of another benzo and i was like what did you do did you suck the, did you suck his dick <laughs> i was like what's his name <laughs> what's the psychiatrist at because <laughs> like literally good luck getting a benzo ever <laughs> yeah and like yeah. and that's a response to the way that we've handled the opioid crisis which is like they've turned off the sink to uh, what used to be free flowing right and now they're afraid that any any poorly written prescription for something that could alleged that is a narcotic or in any way fun could potentially be trigger a DEA investigation and they could lose their license. Right. So now you get people who are like refusing to literally like, I know a psychiatrist who bragged to me once she was like, yeah, I've been practicing for seven years and I've never written a prescription for a benzo. And I was like, so if you're saying you outright never will and you never have, and you never intend to, I don't understand like, and she said that for that and for um, Adderall. And I was like, those are, those are medications. Like you can argue that like, yes, obviously like, like opioids have done on, you know, incalculable damage but those medications also are important right like they help people in the hospice care they also help relieve despair like despair they help relieve like pain when people are dying like this is all important respectful healthcare stuff that should be honored it's not that they are categorically bad and seeing medication as categorically bad is to me a really big mistake like yeah all medication comes with side effects right but again it's like that choice you're making right like medicine isn't about necessarily like taking medication isn't necessarily about like oh this has this will do this everything you need but nothing you don't want here you go no like the whole point of medic like med practicing medicine is about life and also death right it's about benefits and also risks right like that's how every medication works and to say categorically that this one only harms is incorrect yeah well it seems like you're saying they're trying to cover their own ass at the expense of doing what's best for patients. Right. And now I know people who buy street benzos, right? And then they, they dissolved a pill and did a fentanyl test strip and it came up positive. And it turns out instead of taking uh, what they thought was, uh, uh, I think they thought it was Xanax. Yeah. And they took it daily. It was mostly fentanyl. And they'd been taking it daily for a really long time. So they were like, should I stop? And I was like, nope, you're going to go into withdrawal. You should taper off really slowly. You should consider trying to t find a doctor who will help you do that. But like, and that's what people do. Like people, we all know this, like guns being illegal doesn't stop people from buying guns. Right. And something being hard to get doesn't mean people won't. Yeah. Right. And then people look to other sources where they're less safe. They're less regulated. Not to say that regulation equals safety, but the idea of like, you don't know what you're getting when it's a pressed pill from some person. Yeah.
but people are ha- people will want those things and i'm not ne- yeah i guess the, i guess the answer isn't necessarily doctors should just write them freely but i also don't think the answer is okay well now nobody gets it <laughs> like that medication does things and it has benefits it's not for everybody but like that's the point of practicing medicine it's your job to figure out who should yeah yeah um is there anything uh, is there any more shit you want to talk about psychiatrists <laughs> Oh, um, I have a re- uh, recommendation. I don't know if I said this in the first episode um, that we did back in 2020, but um, because I, I can't listen to my own voice. So I had a friend reach out, though, who listened to Keith and the Girl for years and a friend of mine I've known since I was eight. And she was like, hey, you were on my friend. You, you, I love this podcast. I was like, oh, my God. Whoa, crazy. Oh, that's so it was cool. very sweet. Um, that's cool. And um, I was like, oh, wow, the world is actually small. Um, yeah. But uh, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. This book was recommended to me by a very cool radical psychiatrist called it's called um, The Protest Diagnosis. And it's a really interesting book about schizophrenia and its racist history Um, because schizophrenia as a as a diagnosis is, I mean, wow. Talk about the racial segregation there. I know we talked about this in 2020, but the book recommendation stands. It's really good. Um, There are a lot of psychiatrists out there who are working to right the wrongs of a very bad history and shout out to them um, and those and their and their liberation, their liberation focused mindset and the way that they practice um, because it's all too rare. But so there I don't mean to disparage all psychiatrists. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, I was saying like I I think that. I guess like anything, there's good ones and bad ones, you know? True. And actually, at the end of the day, they're just people. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Um, So did you want to talk about some... We could could do two things. We could talk a little about uh, alternative treatments. Mm -hmm. um, And then anything else you want to talk about, and then we can wrap it up. Okay. Sounds good. Um, The alternative treatments uh, that we have for like CPEP specifically? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, or do you mean more like the holistic approach to things? Because I think you're definitely the expert on those things. Well, like the uh, the ACT teams and stuff Oh, like yeah, that? yeah. Yeah, okay. So like if you are admitted to like an inpatient stay, right? Say you're there for like a couple of weeks and now you're stable, but they need to discharge you when you're the closest to stable so that because they need a new bed for somebody who's a lot more acutely ill okay so you get sent home right you're kind of stable but you know the circumstances that brought you to the hospital were pretty pretty severe pretty um like you know like if you were in like police custody and stuff like that you can be court ordered to have what's called assisted outpatient treatment um which is and some people actually opt for this with it so sometimes it's voluntary but um like assisted outpatient treatment, AOT, it, it is esen- essentially since like we've been defunding hospitals since the Reagan years um, and we have not enough beds in this country for our population is a potential solution that some people have tried. And I, I think it works for some people, but it's like if you it's outpatient treatment, which means like you're not staying in the hospital, but it is daily. It's like five days a week. It's like a job. Right. And if you're court ordered to do it and you don't come they're going to call the cops. Like it's like being on parole, but for the hospital. Um, and the idea is to keep monitoring your, your stability and your, your wellness while you're still in the community. So like the good news is you're not locked up in there. The bad news can be that maybe sometimes when we push people into this program, they're not really ready for it. Like maybe they needed a longer inpatient stay or, you know, maybe they, if they're on a daily medication, they feel better. They stop taking it, which of course is a common problem. Yeah. Or, you know, like we have these long acting injectables now that um, a lot of people who have many, many episodes a year uh, actually find really helpful for for I'm talking about psychosis here, like mostly it's schizophrenia and and schizoaffective um, related disorders that are like injectables that last for like six weeks or like a 30 or like 28 days. Yeah. How do those slow release injectables? How does that work? It's very cool science. Um, So the way the medication is formulated is to essentially slowly release over time. We put it into a muscle and un- and sometimes underneath the muscle. This this also exists for um, substance use treatment. We have um, uh, naltrexone, which is um, something that helps decrease the desire to drink, but it's also being studied in methamphetamine. Um, but it basically, when we inject anything into an intramuscular, this is also how hormone therapy works for a lot of trans people who do uh, an injection weekly or every other week. If they do intramuscular, the idea is that the medication is formulated in a way where it will only 
release into your bloodstream over time. So it's safe to give you a big long dose because we're not giving you a dose that's going to go r- immediately into effect, right? Like, like um, if you take one ibuprofen versus two, right? Like you will have more ibuprofen in your system. The, in, the injectables work differently. They're formulated in a way that slowly, um, slowly is metabolized by your body. And as it goes through those two weeks or those 28 days, you will continually get that treatment because of the way that, and this is beyond my knowledge, I'm not a pharmacist, but like in the ways that the, that the medication is like bound in the substance in which it is. Um, so like another, th- like another thing that kind of works similarly, like if you think about like an IUD has um, contraceptive progesterone in its, in, in the, there's a, something that wraps around the IUD that's plastic and it, ha- it is engineered to slowly, because of the heat of your body, release slow microgram doses of the progesterone locally to your uterus f- over seven years, which is why, or different years for different IUDs, but you get the point. Like it is very cool biotechnology that has figured out how to make this happen. Um, and the long acting injectables for things like, sch- like schizophrenia, I think a lot of people, um, who struggle to take their da- their daily medication, or again for people on naltrexone, who you know they might be really seeking sobriety and have these you know starts where they're like, I, "This is it. I'm fucking doing it. I want to be abstinent. I'm I'm going for it, right? Like I I'm so dedicated to it." But then two weeks later, they like if they're less engaged in care or like they lose access to care, what have you, or they're just going through stress of living a daily life, they might lose that. They know that personally they falter there they can opt for this injectable injectable that will cover them for those 28 days. So when they have those, all they need is to find that burst and that dedication to sobriety or whatever, whatever word you'd like to use for that. Um, it, every 28 days to get that, come and get that injection. Whereas if they're taking the, d- the daily pill form of naltrexone, they know that they might come two weeks from now intentionally stop taking it. And they know that that would help. That would give them a lot more, likelihood that would increase their likelihood of re-engaging in use that they're trying to stop long term right so it's a very good option for people who know that uh, that about their own behaviors with schizophrenia it's a little bit different right like you may n- you you may not understand we don't always know what causes we don't know very much about schizophrenia and it's a really troublesome diagnosis in many ways but like if you know for a fact that you experience like something like 20 like 10 to 20 episodes of psychosis a year where you end up in custody or you end up in the CPAP and you're like, I'm fucking sick of living this way. I can't keep, you know, my relationships together. I can't, you know, and of course too, it, it depends on your ability to, um, to like process that about your own life, um, and come to that decision on your own. You can opt for these things that that it's shown like, because you only, you, it's, it basically prevents you from stopping taking your medication intentionally. Yeah. So, so in certain circumstances, it's a good fit for people. And I mean, it, it, more options is never bad. Yeah. Right. Like some people prefer a daily pill, and obviously, lots of people are scared of needles. Like that's the main that's the main thing I hear from anybody with who gets an injection mit- a treatment of any kind, is like people are like, I don't like needles. I'm like, nobody does. Well, I mean, there are some kinky weirdos out there, but you get and yeah. support for kinky weirdos. I'm not trying to <laughs> disparage you either. <laughs> um, I just mean that if if people were like, oh, I love getting my injection, I would be like. That's weird. <laughs> um, and like, I think it's funny because people always say that to me because I have so many tattoos that people see them in the clinic, you know, and they'll be like, you must not be scared of needles. I was like, what do you mean? Like, these hurt really bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also when I get an injection, I am the same way where like if I get my blood drawn, I know I'm nervous. Yeah. I know if I'm drawing your blood, I'm not nervous at all. But the same way that all people get a little nervous when they get something like that. Yeah. It, it's a it's a self-protectionary mechanism. Like, you're not crazy. It's it is a needle and yeah. it would be weird if you loved it anyway <laughs> the point is that it's an option and especially because we know that uh, in a lot of cases when people are taking daily medication that helps them they might say oh look at that i'm all fucking better i don't yeah. need that shit and then they know that that can ha- that can increase their chances for some kind of episode that they know they want to avoid yeah i had a i guess i had a bad i i think i can barely remember this because i was so i think i was like so manic that that they like uh yeah i got the like an abilify injection for oh, i like, forgot they do that for abilify now yeah and did, uh, how did it go for you i remember i mean i remember that it made me feel like shit you know but <laughs> i think i was already feeling like shit i i was i was in i was not a, i'm not a reliable i was not a, i cannot 
currently be a reliable narrator. I was going to say, you're going to use the phrase in all the patient notes. Patient is an unreliable narrator. <laughs> <laughs> or, I, my favorite is, patient is a poor historian. <laughs> That's a thing? Yeah, I love it because I'm like, do you mean that he's like an underpaid professor of history? Uh -huh. Or do you mean that like, uh -huh. or, <laughs> or like he doesn't have a good hold on what happened to five minutes ago? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't, I just remember not enjoying it, but I, yeah. I, I, I was, I don't know, for, for whatever reason for me, like being injected with a medication that I'm knowing, that, knowing there's so much of it in there that's slowly being released into me outside of my control mm -hmm. just freaks me out. I can understand that. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it's, um, cause it is, it is kind of freaky and I definitely understand that. It's like, just, it's just about the. Like, so if you are given an injection of Ativan, right, and it's two milligrams versus, like, another injection that's four milligrams, your body's going to metabolize all four milligrams at once, right? That's more of a dose at the same time that your body's exposed to immediately. Um, similarly, Vyvanse works like this, too. Like, uh, in, in a, I'm saying for the long release. So in capsules of Vyvanse, or Lisdexamphetamine is its generic name, there are different size, like, little pellets of the medication. The small ones your body metabolizes really quickly. They dissolve as you swallow it. They come right, your kidney processes it, dumps it right out. You know, you're getting the benefit of that first few of the smaller ones. Then they're graduated in size throughout the day. So as they keep going in your system and they slowly dissolve and your body slowly metabolizes the larger ones, those are the ones you get at hour 12. So that way it's considered, quote, unabusable, which is a dare, mm. uh, if, if I've ever heard one. But it, um, I actually do really prefer it. Um, that's the medication. It's a medication that I take because rather than Adderall where you get this boom, like you're going to get it all at once. They do have an extended release Adderall, but classic Adderall is literally like you get this like jet fuel. And then like as the day goes on, which, you know, cause we live in this kind of world, you probably work like 18 hours a day. You won't have that same focus that won't, you won't have that same therapeutic benefit at hour 12. Whereas with Vyvanse you do. Okay. But it's kind of the same concept as the long acting injectables. The idea that your body is, we're just using what your your normal metabolism in your kidneys and in your by your liver, all of these things, to your benefit. But obviously, I can understand why people don't like necessarily yeah. getting that treatment for sure. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I just don't like it. But, yeah, and that's but, totally a good but, enough reason. <laughs> but your but that explanation makes me less like uh, scared of it. Less scared of it, or less less having less of a stigma towards it. You know. But again. It's just another option and options are things that people in this particular case, like in mental in like mental health, we don't get a lot of options. Yeah, I think that it's it's such a complicated situation because it's there's no there's nobody really has a total path to what needs to happen for everybody to be OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. people are trying. There's people that are very, uh, you know, committed to the situation and. No pun intended. And I think that I think that I wish that education and preventative care was something that yeah. we really, really uh, valued and really saw as important as acute care. A hundred percent. Yeah. Especially in this particular field. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're really because a lot of times it's the sort of thing where if someone is really fucked up, they're not taking care of their mental health or anything like that. And then they end up in the hospital. They probably haven't begun that process of working in any sort of holistic way on their mental health. And right. if we just would, if we're taught that in schools growing up, I feel like the ripple effect of that could really be something positive. Oh, totally. I agree with you. And like, actually, on that same note, the the other another alternative thing out there is the assertive community treatment teams or ACT teams, which I think actually speaks to your point about like start thinking about prevention, right? Because like, I'm glad the CPEP exists for when it has to. But um, why aren't we trying harder to prevent the instances that people land there, right? Because there are things we can do. We're not completely powerless. Our culture is doing the opposite. It's like driving people into insanity. Literally. On a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. It turns out that if you don't have shelter or you can't be safe, that um, that might actually make you crazy. Yeah. Like, is that is that a delusion or is that a normal reaction to the state of things? Yeah. I don't know. Psychiatrists disagree. But the um, but I have some friends who work on ACT teams, which I think are an important thing. And they're also far from perfect. But I do think that like 
so I don't think you would be a candidate, obviously, for this kind of, you have like a plan and you are doing great. But like for people who really struggle, uh, th- I think it's more often it's not bipolar folks. It's mostly people who experience like really strong psychosis, like um, like dissociative identity disorders and um, different uh, types of schizophrenia and like the r- those kinds of uh, diagnoses where the prevention element is like we have only recently really started to try to do anything about that, right? Um, the ACT teams, um, it's like a team of people. It's usually mil- like multidisciplinary, like an RN maybe um, or uh, and a medical assistant or um, also like therapists and social workers. And they're in the community, right? Like the patients are, are they're not in the hospital. They might have a very severe diagnosis and they, the ACT team meets shows up to their house to, um, you know, the same way that like I don't know if this is for you but for me like I can tell like I'm not doing well when my room's like a fucking mess it's like you know like you know you're just not caring for yourself right like these are ways that we can assess somebody's like closeness to like an episode or something like if they're all of a sudden they're really not showering yeah. right or they they have like they're starting to verbalize the beginnings of what could become a big delusion down the line right so then it's like oh this is a flag that we should flag for the psychiatrist because we might need to think about either changing the therapy or or like changing how often we're checking in on this person because we're trying to prevent the episode from happening now these are also again underfunded plans and a lot of you know it it, i think it's a good thing that exists but i know that my friends who are on act teams here in new york will tell me that like it's really sad to sometimes like see these folks really struggle with like the medication that they know keeps them from out from out of the hospital but has other side effects right like the weight gain or like um, all the different like EPS sim- symptoms, like all the like tongue twirling and all the other stuff that com- can come along with it. Like it's just trying to meet, like rather than throwing people into the hospital as like the only option we have is trying to like meet them in the community where they actually are, try to get them help before it's acute. And I think, I think it's a good option, but obviously it cannot replace the full system. Like we, yeah. that, and it's definitely not appropriate for everybody. Right. Yeah. Like I don't yeah. like, I don't think my diagnoses require that. I don't think like yours does either in our cases, but like it is something that for people who there aren't very many other options, it, it, I'm glad it exists, but I just don't know that it's sufficient. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Something that, uh, I don't know if we ever talked about this. So there's something in certain, cu- in certain States, it's only in a few States called uh mental health court, huh? mental Tell health me community court where ba- where I was able to g- I got to go to mental health court in DC cuz I got arrested you know because I like thought I could shoplift I was like manic I tried to buy some flatbread like I was trying to buy some, like a, <laughs> a flatbread pizza thing and I didn't have any money the car didn't work but I was convinced that like the NSA shut off my money you know what I mean because I was like exposing some truth about something or whatever so then I was like all right so then I just took like a garbage bag and started like filling it up with stuff inside the um Inside a COSI, C-O-S-I. Oh, like the, like yeah. Those, like <laughs> bakery type restaurants or whatever um, that is. And then it was crazy. The people that worked there locked me in. They like went what? out and locked me in. With, by, by yourself? I don't think anybody else was in there because how would they, why would they lock themselves in with somebody that's doing something like that? But <laughs> I remember I got locked in until, oh the, my co- God. until the cops showed up uh, and then I got arrested. So then I had to go to jail, but then, so then, um, when it came to like the court thing, uh, I was able to get into something called mental health community court where it's like people that don't have like, uh, offenses in the past, but have like a history of mental health issues can go in front of this mental health court. And if you do all the things you're supposed to do as in see your doctor, take your medication, uh, et cetera, et cetera, whatever they, whatever you have to go through, you have to, and then you go back to this court once a month for like four months. And if you stay clean, you have to stay clean and do all of those things, then the charges get dismissed. That is a very good alternative to just giving people records. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and I, I graduated from mental health community court. They gave me a certificate so you. and a, and a coin <laughs> <laughs> that said, uh, uh, life is a journey. And then they give me a, a bracelet that said like, uh, life is a journey. 
my mind is strong. Ooh. <laughs> Life is a journey. <laughs> I want to ride. My mind is strong. <laughs> well, I mean, your mind sounded pretty strong also when you decided that the NSA had t- taken all your money. Yeah. <laughs> your mind has always been strong. I think that's part of it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so what uh any any anything else you want to you want to say <laughs> uh i don't you know i don't think so somehow you might be the only person who's gotten me to ever shut up you are such a good talker <laughs> you're great for podcast interviews <laughs> thanks because you'll just go it's not like i ever have to try to be like come on come on <laughs> you're like <laughs> that's you're funny. a great person to interview and it's so insightful it's wonderful it's really great to hear this perspective um you know, because a lot of times I'm interviewing people with uh, with diagnoses and we're going from that angle. And we've talked about your diagnoses and stuff like that as mm-hmm. well. And I think it's so cool how you're open about that. And you have the whole nursing side of stuff. Uh, it's uh, it's really a gift well, for thank you. the uh, psychopath community. Well, and to I get to hear appreciate it. I think thank you very much but also I think I want to thank like you specifically also like we're talking a lot a lot about really personal really tough shit and like you are able to like self-disclose that stuff to me and like trust not just me but this whole community of people with that information like that takes a great amount of like trust and compassion for others so like I want to be clear that like that is also like that is also a gift and like I appreciate that you trust me and like that you can that you, you are so willing to share of your own like struggles because that is it's so stigmatized it's so hard right like it's y- y- i'm sure you've disclosed to people before and had it the reception be pretty negative right like or just people weirded out you know feeling yeah 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 and that's an unfortunate reality for a lot of different people and like taking that risk and being willing to understand that like some people won't get it and those who do you might actually be really helping to normalize and like like help connect like people who are struggling usually in silos completely alone isolated into a a place where like maybe there is like a future beyond the one that we have now like that's a really important aspect of that kind of self-disclosure I think it requires a lot of trust and I appreciate that you trust me but not even just me that this whole community that benefits from you that's so nice to hear thank you no of course that's really cool I appreciate that I really do I just don't give a fuck, you know? See, that's where I'm at, too. <laughs> People are always like, oh, you're just like an open book. I'm like, yeah, because I don't care. <laughs> like, you want to ask me about anything? Like, I will talk loudly about <laughs> syphilis at dinner if you want me to. <laughs> what kind of impression do you want me to make on your new partner? Like, or your mom? <laughs> Actually, parents love me. I'm, I don't usually bring up syphilis around moms. That's good. <laughs> uh, can you let folks know, if you want to, can you let folks know how they can connect with you or anything like that? Um... I generally keep uh, my, uh, well, yeah. well, let's say no then. No. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to say no. I'm just so used People to can reach out to you and you can connect through, you can connect me to anybody who reaches out. How's that? That's fine. We'll do it I, in the back channels. Okay. We'll do a back channel way. I'm so used to just uh, asking guests at the end. Right. Yeah. I figured. Shit, <laughs> and they're just like, here we, yeah, 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 yeah. You can catch me at Cobra Club on Fridays doing No Doubt by Sunday morning. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. She's referring to you now, <laughs> after the comedy show at Cobra Club, there is karaoke. Yes. And she rocks the mic for that. Oh, thank you. No, uh, I just really love Gwen Stefani. Yes. Well, back back in the nineties. Okay. Sorry, yes. Gwen. Yes. Oh, poor <laughs> Gwen. Um, She's fine. <laughs> but yeah, so if you guys have any questions for Sid, feel free to email me at takeyourpillspod at gmail dot com. I'll make sure that she gets them. Um, I'm definitely not against connecting to people. Like I want to hear from people. Uh, I just try to keep my my social media profile on the low. That's good. That's good for your mental health. Us comedians are forced to like pimp out our social medias like it's a fucking full time job. It's fucking awful. And I'm not good at it. I don't want to be good at it. <laughs> it's like, fuck you. No, that's it is not fair. I definitely like knowing a couple of comedians over oh. the years. It seems really it seems it's really bad for hard. mental health. Oh, a hundred percent. It's mental illness inducing by design. God, no, I think about that all the time. Like even just like Instagram, like makeup tutorials. And it turns out that girl's probably in like the eighth grade. Yeah, it's fucked. It's fucked up. I can plug something that's important and relevant. Yeah, do that. Okay, so we all know that Roe is dead, and we knew that it was going to die. It doesn't change the horror of this very fucking moment. But So I want to plug the uh, New York Abortion Access Fund, NIAF, but also 
the National Network of Abortion Funds. Do not give your money to Planned Parenthood. I'm begging you. They do not need it. And also, like, they just use it for lobbying, which is, like, they're right. But, like, you know, they will always have fucking celebrities like Scarlett Johansson to do fucking bullshit for them and fundraise for them. They don't need your goddamn money. People who need abortions and now have to get 800 miles away from home and babysitters and plane tickets and time off work all need your help. And those people are mostly in the South. Um, and definitely like there's funds that are helping people get there. And the best way to find the one closest to you or in an area that needs it is through the national network of abortion funds on their website. And they are definitely, definitely need your help. Um, so if you care, donate there. Um, yes, please do that. Um, and, uh, what I want to say is, uh, I appreciate you guys so much listening. Uh, you psychos, this is awesome that you guys are part of this community. Um, this has been another episode of Take Your Pills Psychopath, the comedy podcast that exploits mental illness for personal profit. Trademark what? I'm your host, John F. O'Donnell, J. Fod, and I've been interviewing the wonderful Sid Casey. Thanks, Sid. Thank you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>